This is the magnificent atrium of the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, opened in 1909, rebuilt after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire destroyed the original structure. On the eighth floor of this hotel, room 8064, now room 888, on August 2, 1923, Warren G. Harding, 29th President of the United States, was laying in bed about 7 p.m., talking to his wife, Florence, who was reading to him an article from the Saturday Evening Post. After a pause, President Harding said, go on, read some more. A few seconds later, he died quite suddenly. Age 57, Harding was the fifth president to die in office. I can't guarantee that what you're seeing on the screen is the exact suite where it happened. The hotel has been extensively remodeled since 1923, but it may have been, though unfortunately the bedroom isn't visible on Google Maps. The death of Warren Harding was both very sudden and also not that surprising. He was on a tour of Alaska, Western Canada, and the U.S. West Coast in advance of his 1924 re-election campaign, and he'd already had some health problems. The president took sick in Seattle on July 27th. His doctors thought it might have been some bad crab meat that he ate, but there was considerable evidence not fully recognized at the time that he had a serious heart condition, and he may have had a mild heart attack in Seattle. Whatever Harding actually died of in San Francisco on August 2nd, we'll never know for sure. Within an hour of his death, the now widowed former first lady, Florence Harding, ordered her husband to be embalmed and refused all requests for an autopsy. I'll return to the subject of Harding's cause of death in a few minutes, but there was the small matter of who was now going to be president of the United States. News of Harding's death hit the wire services at 7.51 p.m. West Coast time, 10.51 p.m. on the East Coast. Vice President Calvin Coolidge was staying with his parents here at the Coolidge Homestead in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, which, as you see from this Google Earth shot, is way out in the countryside. Coolidge was apparently also vacationing in another century. The town of Plymouth Notch didn't even have a telegraph station. The White House sent a telegram to White River Junction, then to Bridgewater. The telegraph operator at Bridgewater tried to phone the store at Coolidge Homestead, but the entire Coolidge family was asleep. The telegraph operator gathered together a stenographer, Coolidge's official chauffeur, and a reporter. They set out for Plymouth Notch in the vice presidential limousine. Coolidge was asleep when the word came. After being awakened and given the news, Coolidge put on a suit, went down to the family parlor, and by the light of a kerosene lamp, the Coolidge house didn't have electricity in 1923, he was administered the oath of office by his father, a local justice of the peace. Then, entirely consistent with his character, Calvin Coolidge, now 30th president of the United States, went back to bed. Harding's death and the accession of Coolidge as president occurred just 15 months before the next presidential election, in which Harding had been widely expected to be re-elected fairly easily. Coolidge was only the second former vice president who, after being elevated to office by the death of his former boss, decided to seek election as president in his own right and had the support of the majority of his party to do so. You probably know that Coolidge succeeded in his bid for the presidency, and how. With 54% of the popular vote in carrying 35 states, Coolidge, a Republican, seemingly won the 1924 election without breaking a sweat, and while saying as few words as possible. The economy was booming, the country seemed generally happy and well-contented, and Coolidge was thought of as competent and honest, in contrast to the historical reputation of his predecessor. At first glance, then, the 1924 election appears to be one that it's not worth spending much time examining. History books don't spend much time on it. Coolidge's Democratic opponent, John W. Davis of West Virginia, is one of the most obscure and forgettable major party nominees in American history. You probably didn't even know before clicking on this video that 1924 was actually a three-way race. The other major candidate was Robert La Follette senator from Wisconsin making an independent bid. But who cares? Harding was dead, Coolidge won, and the election constitutes barely more than a footnote in the history of the 1920s, as it's usually told. The Jazz Age boom cycle that F. Scott Fitzgerald in The Great Gatsby called the Golden Roar. But it turns out the 1924 election was actually pretty important and pretty interesting. And as its story is virtually ignored in American history, it's an irresistible subject for the deep dive historical treatment.
I think you'll be surprised, as I was, drilling into the fascinating story of this contest, just how consequential it was, and how much of a shame that it's most often overlooked. This video is the story of the presidential election of 1924, the most interesting election you've probably never heard of. Hi, I'm Sean Munger, I'm a historian, and my niche here on YouTube is deep dive videos with a lot of context on various historical topics, some of them obscure and overlooked, or more well-known events shown from an unconventional angle. My past video that this one is most like is my look last year at the presidential election of 1872, or the unusual and tragic presidency of Franklin Pierce, one of the more forgotten chief executives but whose life story is interesting and illuminating. This video comes from a similar place. This is now an election year, 2024, and as presidential elections in American history go, the one that took place 100 years ago is almost always ranked among the sleepers. Coolidge himself is one of the least discussed presidents of the past century or so, with no memorable achievements like FDR's New Deal, Truman's policy of containment, LBJ's Great Society, or Reaganomics lurking in the historical record to remind us of his name. So why should you spend the greater part of three hours learning about how he got elected? The reason is because a lot of important currents in 20th century American history converge in the story of the 1924 election. Progressivism, conservatism, race, gender, the limitations and frustrations of the two-party political system, just to name a few. Regardless of what happens politically in this tumultuous election year in America, I can guarantee that millions of Americans this fall will look at their presidential ballots and say to themselves, this is the choice we've got? How did it come down to this? Millions of Americans said exactly the same thing when they looked at their ballots a century ago. Even if there was no other reason why we should look closely at the election of 1924, this would justify the time I hope you'll spend with me on this subject. In the history of presidential elections, 1924 is known for something unusual. It had the longest single major party convention in American history, with the Democratic Convention held in New York City stretching to 16 days, and which took 103 ballots to nominate their eventual candidate, John W. Davis. An entire book was written about that convention. That book was one of the sources for this video, which are listed at the end and also in the description. I'm gonna be talking about that, of course, the convention, but that's not the only or even the most important story of the 1924 election. In the 20 teens, a meme purporting to be about the 1924 election and specifically the Democratic Convention became suddenly popular on Facebook and other social media. This photo of a Ku Klux Klan march was said to be a picture of the Klan marching on the Democratic Convention. That is false. The photo wasn't taken until December 1924 after the election was over and had nothing to do with the convention at all. A similar and related meme from the 20 teens asserted that the 1924 Democratic Convention was prop popularly known as the Klan Bake. That's also false, as only one reporter at the time ever used that word, and the term Klan Bake did not reappear in print until the year 2000. Racism and the Klan were a significant factor in all three parties and campaigns in 1924. Obviously, I'll be talking about them, so, but just so you know, those memes are fake. Bear with me, there's an unusually large amount of context we have to get through to understand what was happening in America in 1924. And we'll get to it in just a moment. Navigating today's media environment can be overwhelming. Staying informed is crucial, yet the constant barrage of news often fuels anxiety for many people, myself included. That's why I've been using this app and website by Ground News to get control over my news consumption. Ground News is an app and a website that serves as a tool to guide you through the maze of bias, sensationalism, and disinformation that permeate today's complicated media landscape. Let me show you how it works. I've been following news on the 2024 election, and this story caught my attention. On the website, we can see that it's been covered by more than 20 articles with the majority leaning right and center. Ground News even shows you each story's political leaning, how factual their reporting practices are, who owns the publication, 
and where in the world it is or isn't being covered. Looking closer at this story, we can see that the headlines on the left are focused on Ted Cruz's past relationship with Trump, while the right focuses more on a united front against Joe Biden. All of these tools help paint a more accurate picture of the story, so I can become more informed about the full story rather than understanding only one piece of the puzzle. Back in the 1920s, you could only dream of having that sort of insight into news reporting. Ground News is a great tool to think critically about the information we consume and make sure that we're getting more diverse perspectives. I think what they're doing is really important. Go to ground.news slash munger to stay fully informed and think critically about what's happening around the world. Subscribe through my link to get 40% off the Vantage plan for unlimited access. And by subscribing to them, you'll be supporting my channel in the meantime. Now, back to the historical story. The official cause of President Harding's death listed on his death certificate was a cerebral hemorrhage, but not very many people today believe that's literally true. The fact that Harding died so suddenly, and especially his wife's refusal to allow an autopsy, fueled a great deal of speculation in America and a fair share of conspiracy theories. Some of those who came in for particular criticism were Harding's doctors. One of them, Dr. Ray Lyman Wilbur, also president of Stanford University, blamed the press for the storm of criticism aimed at the doctors. He said, quote, We were beleaguered and attacked by newspapers antagonistic to Harding, and by cranks, quacks, anti-vivisectionists, the nature healers, the Dr. Albert Abrams electronic diagnosis group, and many others. We were accused of starving the president to death, of feeding him to death, of assisting and slowly poisoning him, and of plying him to death with pills and purgatives. We were accused of being abysmally ignorant, stupid, and incompetent, and even of malpractice." End quote. One of the conspiracy theories was that Florence Harding had gradually poisoned her husband with slow doses of arsenic. Gaston Means, a con man and prohibition bootlegger, published a salacious book in 1930 called The Strange Death of President Harding that made this claim, and he threw a lot of other accusations at the late president. His book was later debunked, and Means himself disavowed it in 1933. There is no evidence that Harding was murdered. He was having an affair, though, more than one, in fact, for 15 years, from 1905 until he accepted the Republican presidential nomination in 1920, Harding carried on a torrid love affair with Carrie Fulton Phillips, wife of one of his business associates. Phillips blackmailed the Republican Party, threatening to expose love letters between her and Harding unless they paid her a cool chunk of change, which they did. She was also sympathetic to the government of Germany during World War I. The love letters between Phillips and Harding, donated to the Library of Congress, were made public in 2014, though the contents of some of them were known long before that. Harding also had an affair with a woman called Nan Britton, also from Harding's hometown of Marion, Ohio, and who became infatuated with Harding while she was still a teenager. Britton virtually stalked the then-senator and ultimately had an affair with him. Harding's paternity of their love child, Elizabeth, was often scoffed at by historians as a salacious rumor, until 2015, when DNA testing proved beyond all doubt that Harding was indeed Elizabeth's father. One of the more colorful assertions about Nan Britton was that she and Harding had sex in a closet at the White House. Now, you can't prove something like that, but it may well have happened. Harding has the historical reputation of being the most scandal-plagued president, at least until Richard Nixon came along. While it's hard to dispute this, the thing is that most of the Harding administration's scandals didn't come to light until after his death in August 1923. The most well-known of these scandals was Teapot Dome. This involved sweetheart oil leases on or near federally owned land in Wyoming called Teapot Dome, you're looking at it right now, which were given by government officials, especially Secretary of the Interior Albert Fall, to fat cats and oil company execs on a non-competitive basis. There was also a scandal involving the Veterans Administration, which had begun to come out while Harding was still alive. This one involved overfunded contracts, a classic maneuver of government and private industry graft. Charles Forbes, the head of the Veterans Administration Bureau, resigned in February 1923. 
his chief counsel committed suicide as the congressional investigation into the scandal began to ramp up. Additionally, there was a bunch of nest feathering at the Justice Department, run by Harding's hopelessly corrupt attorney general and good friend Harry Doherty. Separating what undeniable corruption, bribery, and graft that was really going on in the Harding White House versus the accusations and salacious gossip that swirled around is almost impossible. A closer, in-depth look at Harding's scandal specifically is beyond our scope here, though I have considered doing a video on it. Suffice it to say, Harding was pretty dirty. But the thing was, not a whole lot of this sordid mess was known at the time he croaked in 1923. Some of the trials for scandal-related participants were still going on five years later. So it wasn't, for the most part, like examples of scandals in later American history that attached to a sitting president. Many Americans followed the news of the scandals, but it was considered to be in poor taste or speaking ill of the dead to dwell too much on them. Harding was generally popular and well-liked in 1923. The long voyage of the train that slowly brought his body back from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., modeled on Lincoln's famous funeral train from 1865, was witnessed solemnly by about 9 million people. Harding's body lay in state at the Capitol. He was then buried in his hometown of Marion, Ohio, though his impressive marble column tomb wasn't dedicated until 1931. Coolidge slowly and quietly took charge of the duties of president. He held his first cabinet meeting on August 14th, after his return from Harding's funeral. Dealing with a coal miner's strike, a minor diplomatic flap involving Cuba, and political chaos in Germany were among the earliest items that the new president had to deal with. But he said remarkably little to the press. The Coolidge White House was, above all, quiet. As America would soon find out, that's how it was going to be most of the time. To understand Coolidge and the political backdrop against which the 1924 election would play out, we have to navigate a lot of context. We're going to start doing that in the next chapter. By 1924, America was nearing the end of, or had already come out of, depending on who you ask, about a 30-year period of its history that was marked by the spirit of reform. Historians often call this the Progressive Era. After the excesses of the Gilded Age in the late 19th century, many Americans turned their attention to reforming, remaking, or checking the power of institutions, usually business ones, while other Americans stood steadfastly against the tide of change. This push and pull between progressivism and conservatism powered much of the country's political, social, and economic history, between roughly 1890 and 1920. A quintessential example of a progressive era reformer was Jane Addams, who founded Hull House in Chicago. Hull House was dedicated to improving the lives of poor and immigrant families in the inner city. Addams was also passionately involved in feminism and women's issues, especially the long-running fight for women's suffrage. Feminists like Adams, Alice Paul, and Jeanette Rankin, the first woman to sit in Congress, finally achieved one of their signature successes with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920, granting women the right to vote on a national basis. Some historians date the start of the Progressive Era from 1896, largely because of the issues of the highly contentious presidential election of that year. This was a time of economic distress. The Panic of 1893 was just the latest of the savage recessions that marked the late 19th century, and many Americans, especially farmers in the West and Midwest, felt like the economic and political systems were rigged against them. Currency and monetary policy were big issues in this period. Sounds dull, I know, but a lot of people got hot and bothered over whether or not currency should be backed by gold. William Jennings Bryan, former congressman from Nebraska, captured the Democratic nomination for president in 1896 with a rousing speech called the Cross of Gold speech about how much he hated the gold standard. He thought that abandoning the gold standard would reduce debts held by farmers and laborers and make credit cheaper. Ultimately, 1896 became a battle between the reforming progressive spirit, the gold standard was far from the only thing that Bryan wanted to reform, and pro-business, pro-corporate conservatism, embodied by the Republican candidate, William McKinley. McKinley won in 1896, and in fact again in 1900 against William Jennings Bryan, a rematch 
But it wasn't as simple as Democrats were progressives and Republicans were conservatives. That's not how it was at all. After an anarchist pumped McKinley's paunchy belly full of lead in a Buffalo music hall in 1901, and McKinley's doctors botched what in a later era probably would have been a survivable medical crisis, the new president, Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican, proved one of the most dynamic and successful figures of the progressive era. Roosevelt championed conservationism, pure food and drug regulations, banking reform, and especially using the power of the federal government to break up abusive monopolies. Trust busting, it was then called. One of the most important progressive leaders and a main character in the story of the 1924 election was Robert Marion La Follette, a Republican from Wisconsin. I'll deal more directly with him in Chapter 5, but he was a powerful force in progressive politics beginning in the 1890s, serving as governor of Wisconsin and eventually senator, where he was first a friend, then an enemy of Theodore Roosevelt. Other progressives across the political spectrum championed different causes. This era was, for example, the high watermark of America's Socialist Party. Eugene Debs ran for president on the Socialist ticket five times between 1900 and 1920 steadily increasing his percentage of the popular vote each time. Woodrow Wilson, the first Democratic president of the 20th century, embodied both traditions, progressivism and conservatism, at the same time. Not that others like Teddy Roosevelt didn't also, but the dual nature of Wilson's political legacy is especially prominent. Wilson presided over various progressive projects, such as the establishment of the Federal Reserve, income tax, banking reform, and more trust-busting, while opposing or dragging his feet on other initiatives. Wilson was at first against women's suffrage, but ultimately supported it. His record on civil rights and racial issues was generally pretty poor. Indeed, the progressive era coincided with perhaps the worst decades of state-enforced repression against African Americans. Jim Crow in the South, discrimination and segregation in many parts of the North, too, endless waves of lynching and racially motivated violence, and the maintenance of systems that generally prevented people of color from making any sort of economic or social progress. And not just African Americans. Asians were terribly discriminated against, such as with racist immigration policies. Native Americans weren't even considered citizens. Gay and LGBT liberation hadn't even started yet. So it's clear that the progressive reforming spirit only went so far, if Wilson was an embodiment of that, so was William Jennings Bryan, who, despite never becoming president, remained one of the most important progressive politicians throughout the whole era. Bryan, a Democrat, was fiercely progressive, but he was also socially very conservative. He was a fundamentalist Christian and what we would today call a young earth creationist, insisting on the literal truth and inerrancy of the Bible, for example, which would play a role in the final act of his life, as we'll see later. Bryan ran for president third time in 1908, and even after that remained in the background as a would-be kingmaker. As late as 1924, Democratic politicians on the national level had to either contend with Bryan and his influence, or find some way to go around him. Bryan also served as Woodrow Wilson's first Secretary of State, but he resigned from the cabinet in 1915 in protest of what he saw as Wilson's belligerent attitude in the wake of the sinking of the ocean liner Lusitania by a German submarine. Now let's talk about Wilson for a moment. A former Princeton history professor, before he became governor of New Jersey, Wilson was elected in 1912, largely because Roosevelt, running third party, he even called his party the Progressive Party, drew off a significant portion of the vote that might otherwise have gone to his former friend, William Howard Taft, then running for re-election. Essentially, Taft and Roosevelt split the Republican vote, and Wilson was elected with barely more than 40% of the popular vote. The various progressive programs Wilson was really interested in, which he referred to in 1912 as the New Freedom Program, kept getting interrupted by foreign policy crises, such as the collateral effects of the ongoing Mexican Revolution, resulting in limited military actions along the U.S.-Mexico border, and most importantly, the outbreak of World War I in Europe. Wilson's wife also died on the very weekend the war broke out, so he was beset with a deep personal and emotional crisis as well. He rebounded from that, 
Within a year, Wilson had fallen in love with another woman, Edith Galt, and married her in December 1915. Wilson was the third and to date the last president to get married while in office. Oh, something else about Wilson's family. In May 1914, Wilson's youngest daughter, Eleanor, married William Gibbs McAdoo, a friend and confidant of Wilson who had worked on his 1912 campaign and whom the president had appointed Secretary of the Treasury. So McAdoo became Wilson's son-in-law. Got that? After the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915 and Wilson's angry warnings to Germany to, you know, stop killing people by sinking ships with their submarines, the fuse was burning down to America's involvement in World War I. By the skin of his teeth, Wilson won re-election in 1916 without having to face the decision of whether or not to declare war on Germany. But in early 1917, when the Germans turned their submarine warfare machine back on, the issue became paramount. Although Congress alone has the power to declare war, for political reasons, the decision of whether to bring the U.S. into World War I was basically Wilson's alone. If he asked Congress for a declaration of war, congressmen and senators would be under enormous pressure to grant it. Now, it might seem like World War I and the German submarine warfare issue was an interruption of Wilson's progressive odyssey, though actually, in many ways, it was a continuation of it. When Wilson addressed Congress on April 2, 1917, to ask for a declaration of war, he framed it not as retaliation against Germany for killing Americans on the high seas, but as a moral crusade for freedom of the seas and ultimately for democracy itself. The phrase, we must make the world safe for democracy, comes from this speech, and it perfectly embodies the narrative of the war that Wilson had sold himself and ultimately the country. To him, World War I was noble, an effort to reform the world the way the progressive movement had, he believed, reformed the United States. Voting against war with Germany did prove politically costly for the dissenters in Congress. Most of those who voted no were defeated at the next election, such as Jeanette Rankin, congresswoman from Montana. Robert La Follette also voted no, but he'd last been elected in 1916 and wouldn't face re-election until 1922. But an attempt was made in the Senate to censure him for his outspoken views opposing the war, which his political enemies spun as him being pro-German. The war sharply divided America. Many progressives bristled at Wilson's draconian policies to suppress dissent during the war. Others resisted or criticized federal control of industries, and the effect of the war on labor and labor unions. Many thought the U.S. shouldn't have gotten involved at all. On the surface, patriotism and jingoism were at a fever pitch. German Americans, for example, faced discrimination and even violence in some cases. But there was a strong undercurrent of discontent. When the fighting stopped in Europe in November 1918 and negotiations for a peace treaty got underway, Wilson went all in. He traveled to Europe in December and remained in Paris for months, the longest absence a U.S. president has ever taken from American soil. Wilson, whose idealistic vision for a new approach to international relations was embodied by his famous 14 points, issued in January 1918, became enamored with the idea of a League of Nations, a world deliberative body that he thought would usher in an era of world peace, a very progressive concept, but a pretty naive one to be sure. Wilson's pursuit of the League of Nations was dogged and unyielding. He was antagonistic toward the U.S. Senate, particularly Republicans opposed to ratifying the Treaty of Versailles. Then, while on a whistle-stop speaking tour in fall 1919 to drum up support for the treaty, Wilson suffered a debilitating stroke, and a second even more catastrophic one after returning to Washington. The Senate rejected the treaty. Wilson, now an invalid, was bedridden. His wife, Edith, carefully controlled access to him. And for all intents and purposes, she was pretty much running the country. There was another major factor affecting politics in this period, perhaps surprisingly the biggest factor, prohibition. A comprehensive history of the prohibition movement is beyond the scope of this video. But what you need to know is that the 18th Amendment, which prohibited the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages in most cases, was a very long time in coming. Its roots stretched back to the temperance movement of the mid-19th century, and in fact, even earlier. Various prohibition-minded organizations, like the Anti-Saloon League, had been pushing a national alcohol ban for decades, 
but the Progressive Era, and particularly World War I, provided a very narrow and short-lived window of political and social conditions that uh, enabled them to succeed. Most brewers of beer in the United States were of German extraction, and anti-German sentiment of the war years essentially weaponized prohibition. Ban beer so we can stick it to those awful Germans. Prohibition was also heavily backed by Protestant religious conservatives, including William Jennings Bryan. That becomes important later, too. Some states, Kansas, for example, already had state-level alcohol prohibitions long before the national one took effect. And after April 1917, with the war on, conserving grain to feed the troops became another convenient excuse to support prohibition. A national-level prohibition with this the conservation of grain as its express purpose was passed by Congress in November 1918, ironically right after the armistice. But states were considering, and many had already ratified, the proposed 18th Amendment by the time of the end of the war. On January 16, 1919, the amendment went over the top in terms of ratifications. It went into official effect a year and a day later, in January 1920, but many parts of the U.S. were already dry by then. Both political parties, though, Democrats and Republicans, had pro- and anti-prohibition wings, usually known as, known as dries and wets. Even though the amendment was in effect and Congress gave the federal government the power to enforce it via the Volstead Act of 1920, the political battle between wets and dries was just beginning. So this was the situation when the presidential campaign of 1920 began to ramp up. Wilson's wife was desperate to get him in for a third term. She thought that being president was the only thing he had to live for, and being out of office would kill him. But the Democratic Party was pretty chilly on the idea. Yet Wilson and his cronies still had a lot of influence in the party. The strongest candidate, at least on paper, was Wilson's son-in-law, William McAdoo. But Wilson, or whoever was speaking for Wilson, most likely his wife, let it be known that the president did not want McAdoo's name to come up at the nominating convention in San Francisco. The idea was that the convention would be deadlocked, and the party bosses would then turn to Wilson to run for a third term. Yeah, right. After a fractious convention, not nearly the disaster that the 1924 convention would be, but still pretty messy, ultimately Ohio Governor James Cox captured the nomination. The vice presidential nomination went to the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, an ambitious young man from New York State named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The Democrats would have had a hard time regardless of who they nominated in 1920, but the Republicans weren't in much better shape. The party had been leaderless at a national level since Theodore Roosevelt died suddenly in January 1919. The Republican convention held in Chicago was basically a race full of dark horses and regional favorites. The convention deadlocked between Leonard Wood, an army general, and Frank Loudon, governor of Illinois. This is the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago, where most of the Republican Party bosses stayed during the convention in June 1920. Legend has it that in a suite in this hotel, late at night in a room choked with cigar smoke, the party bosses met and decided on Senator Warren G. Harding of Ohio as a compromised candidate choice to break the deadlock, the quintessential dark horse nominee. This story, told principally by Harding's political fixer, Harry Doherty, later Attorney General, is the genesis of the phrase, smoke-filled room. What you're seeing on the screen is a room in the Blackstone Hotel as it appears today. I don't know the story behind this specific Google Maps photosphere or whether this exact room is purported to be the very one where the decision happened, but I do notice, framed on the wall of this room, is a sheet of stamps bearing Warren, Warren Harding's face. So this may be the smoke-filled room, it may not be. I guess it doesn't matter. Harding, a fairly obscure but affable senator who said little in his political career to offend anybody, did get the nomination. His campaign caught the public spirit by promising a return to quote-unquote normalcy, a word that did not exist in 1920, but which Harding coined. The idea was that a Harding administration would return America to its conservative principles and presumably close the door on all that progressive crusading, especially overseas. Republican policy in 1920 promised isolationism rather than engagement with the rest of the world. 
The Republicans chose as Harding's running mate the equally inoffensive governor of Massachusetts, Calvin Coolidge, who was popular because of his principled stand during a Boston police strike in 1919. Harding and Coolidge weren't exactly Washington and Lincoln, but they never tried to be. After 30 years of progressivism and a disillusioning foreign war, the country was ready for a rest. The 1920 election was basically a coronation of Warren Harding. He blasted James Cox into orbit with 60.4% of the popular vote and 404 electoral votes to 127. Interestingly, Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate, scored his highest number of popular votes in any of his five runs for president, despite running for office from a prison cell where he was doing time for speaking out against the draft during World War I. There's a popular legend that women enfranchised on the national level for the first time in 1920 tended to vote for Harding because they thought he was hot. There is no evidence to substantiate that. Only one state, Illinois, distinguished between the sexes in their voting data. Near as we can tell, though, the turnout for women in the 1920 election was about 35% against an estimated 67% for men. Women did not vote as a bloc, as some had feared. They supported the major parties and were generally less likely to support third parties like socialists or farmer labor. But interestingly, support for prohibition seemed higher among women than men. Going into the White House in March 1921, poor Wilson could barely make it to the car that carried him to the inauguration. Harding and the Republicans believed, with significant justification, that they had a mandate from the American people. And Harding remained quite popular during his time in office. When he croaked in that hotel room in San Francisco in August 1923, it was a shock, but many Americans felt like the presidency was still in capable hands. The owner of those hands, Calvin Coolidge, is the subject of the next chapter. John Calvin Coolidge Jr. is one of the most obscure presidents of the United States. If you've heard anything about him, what you're most likely to know is that he didn't talk much. Probably the most famous anecdote about Coolidge was that at a dinner party, a woman supposedly said to him something to the effect of, I made a bet that I can make you say more than two words. And his response was, You lose. This anecdote was printed in newspapers in 1924, but Coolidge said it never happened. In many respects, Coolidge was the last 19th century man to be president. By that, I don't mean the last person born in the 19th century. Clearly, that's not the case. But I mean the last person who lived his life as if it was still the 19th century. He was, for example, the last U.S. president not to have a telephone on his desk. I find that a very telling detail. Because he was a 19th century man, Coolidge came into politics and national prominence in much the same way that presidents did in the 19th century. Franklin Pierce, for example, whom I did a lengthy video on. Born in Vermont, Coolidge moved to Northampton, Massachusetts to start a law practice. He was a res well-respected small-town business lawyer and eventually entered local and then state politics. A Republican from the word go, Coolidge was solidly but not fanatically conservative, dependable, and highly likable despite his quiet and introverted nature. He entered the Massachusetts State House in 1907, State Senate 1912, and was Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts under Samuel Call by 1916, before winning election as governor in his own right in 1918. Coolidge's approach to problems was sensible, generally not extreme. He was naturally pro-business. He didn't identify as a progressive, though he supported some traditionally progressive positions. By most accounts, Coolidge was a more fun and interesting guy than the silent Cal stories give him credit for. He had a solid and vibrant marriage. Grace Coolidge was undoubtedly one of the classiest first ladies we've ever had. Lou Hoover or even Eleanor Roosevelt never looked like this. They had two sons, John born in 1906, he lived until the year 2000 if you can believe it, and Calvin Jr. born in 1908. Calvin Jr. features in our story later. Their father, Calvin Coolidge, was a solid, workaday, largely unremarkable New England politician of the early 20th century. There was nothing in his background that suggested he was destined for the big chair. The tumultuous politics of this era, though, delivered a golden opportunity right into Coolidge's lap. The progressive era was dominated by labor unrest, strikes, unionization, anti-union efforts by big business, 
and political and ideological battles, some of them fairly radical, over labor issues. In September 1919, while Coolidge was governor of Massachusetts, Boston's police force went on strike. It was illegal for the police to unionize, but they had a pretty extensive list of grievances. They did not earn anything close to a living wage, they worked long hours, endured hazardous conditions, and even had to pay for their own bullets. And the state government was slow to respond to them. When attempts to reach a compromise failed, the Boston police went on strike on September 9th. The magnitude of the effect of the police strike on the city of Boston is a subject of controversy. There were some riots and looting, but there's evidence it was pretty localized and not widespread. Nevertheless, it's hard to argue with the fact that nine people died in various incidents that would have been preventable if police had been on the job. Even the head of the American Federation of Labor, the unforgettably named Samuel Gompers, urged the cops to return to work. They refused. Predictably waiting until it was clear no one else was going to step in and resolve the situation, Coolidge fired a thousand Boston police officers and authorized the recruitment of replacements, mostly unemployed World War I veterans. He famously declared, quote, There is no right to strike against the public safety anywhere, anytime. The grievances of the police were not really resolved, at least not right away. But in political circles, Coolidge's actions were hailed as heroic, including by such a prominent Democrat as Woodrow Wilson, who congratulated Coolidge on his law and order stance. Conservatives who feared the growing influence of labor unions had a new hero. Coolidge was easily re-elected governor in 1919. There is some evidence that he did want to run for president, and his friends and boosters in Massachusetts formed a committee for his campaign in early 1920. One thing I should mention is that there were presidential primaries at this time, but they were not the determinative factor in who became a presidential nominee. Primaries were generally used to measure the strength of a potential candidate in a particular state. In the Massachusetts presidential primary of 1920, Coolidge won, winding up with some delegates pledged to him. But once at the convention, party bosses could literally lend and borrow delegates from each other for strategic purposes. This was why those cigar-smoking men who met in possibly this room at the Blackstone Hotel in Chicago could wheel and deal about who was going to be the nominee. The cigar chompers wanted Senator Irvine Lenroot of Wisconsin as the VP nominee. Can you imagine in this alternate timeline if Harding had still croaked in August 1923, we would have had President Lenroot. But the delegates at the 1920 convention, many of whom resented the control of the cigar chompers, were restive. Also, some of the party bosses started to leave Chicago after Harding's nomination, not least because the convention was running long and their hotel bills were getting pretty high. On the floor of the convention, one delegate from Oregon, Wallace McCammont, spoke up for recognition from the convention chair. He gave a short speech in which he announced that the Oregon delegation wanted Calvin Coolidge for vice president. The sustained applause to this speech impressed the remaining delegates and the reporters present. One by one, state delegations began chiming in for Coolidge. Eager to get their business done and to get the hell out of there, the delegates organized a hasty vote. And on June 12, 1920, Coolidge was selected, not in the smoke-filled room, but by the delegates themselves. Coolidge didn't do a whole lot during the 1920 campaign. Most of the attention was focused on Harding. Coolidge gave some speeches in New England and the Northeast, and he went on a tour of the South in October, but Republican leaders realized that he wasn't that energizing as a campaigner, and he probably couldn't convert a lot of votes who weren't already going to pull the lever for Harding. It didn't matter much. Harding, as we've seen, was cruising for an epic and overwhelming win. In 1921, there was no official residence for the vice president of the United States. The Coolidge's were solidly middle class, but not wealthy, and the office of vice president paid only $12,000 a year at that time. The outgoing vice president, Thomas Marshall, had been living in a two-room apartment at the new Willard Hotel in Washington. He offered to turn the place over to the Coolidge's, and they accepted. As anyone who's held the office of vice president will tell you, there's really not much to do. Coolidge sometimes attended cabinet meetings and presided over the Senate, as is the vice president's constitutional obligation. 
Other than that, he and Grace went out to official dinners a lot, but they were quite dull. A reporter once asked Coolidge why he went to so many dinners. His response, got to eat somewhere. But during this period, Silent Cal watched intently what was going on behind the scenes. He rarely offered an opinion and never intervened directly. It's unclear what, if anything, he knew about the scandals and graft underlying the Harding administration. It seems likely that Harding and his crooked cronies would deliberately have kept an upstanding man like Calvin Coolidge in the dark as to what they were doing. Coolidge himself was resigned to the very real possibility that Harding, or more likely the cigar chompers, would dump him off the ticket in 1924 in favor of someone else. And there is evidence to suggest that if, if that happened, Coolidge would have retired from politics and not sought any further office. Probably he would have wound up practicing law back in Massachusetts. Then, in late July 1923, the Coolidge family went up to Plymouth Notch to spend time with Coolidge's father. His mother had died when he was a teenager, but his father had remarried. They were scheduled to go home on August 3rd, the day after Harding's death. Whatever killed President Harding, his bad heart or some bad crab meat, as some suggested, whatever it was, it suddenly thrust Coolidge onto the stage of history. His record as president in the early months after Harding died was competent, but pretty uneventful. Coolidge was generally pledged to continue Harding's policies. In December 1923, as Congress convened, Coolidge delivered the State of the Union Address. Wilson had been the first president to give it in person, but Coolidge's speech was the first time it was carried on radio nationwide. There were no major domestic or international crises in late 1923 or early 24. That probably inured to Coolidge's benefit. He does not seem to have considered not running for president in his own right in 1924. Indeed, shortly after assuming the office, Coolidge started building relationships with national Republican leaders, the cigar chompers, to ensure his easy nomination at the upcoming convention. Unfortunately for our story, there's not much drama in Coolidge's decision to run. He just sort of took it in stride, like everything else, and said as little as possible. If Coolidge was keeping cool, pun very much intended, the Democratic Party was losing its mind going into 1924. That's where we're turning in the next chapter, and it's one of the major threads of our story. On February 3rd, 1924, Woodrow Wilson died in this room, located in the house he and his wife rented in Washington, D.C. Wilson had dominated the Democratic Party and its political machinery for a dozen years, though the last five he was pretty ineffectual as a result of his illnesses and disabilities. It's telling that going into 1924, the strongest potential candidate was thought to be Wilson's son-in-law, William McAdoo. But once unquestionably out of the age of Wilson, the 1920s Democratic Party was an unholy mess. Since the 1890s, the beginning of the Progressive Era, the Democratic Party had largely been a coalition of political interests of the southern and western states, predominantly rural, religiously conservative, and usually racist. But after World War I, the southern-western rural coalition was splintering, largely as a result of the influence of big city Democratic political machines, like Tammany Hall in New York. Here's one way to look at it. Post-Wilson, the Democratic Party was really three parties, all heavily regional. One was the Eastern and Northern Urban Democratic Party. People like Al Smith, governor of New York, and his good friend Franklin D. Roosevelt were the exemplars of this wing of the party. The Eastern Northern wing tended to be either the home of rich elites like Roosevelt or lower class ethnic city dwellers, the kind of people who lived in Hell's Kitchen in New York or the Irish wards of South Boston, and whose political activity had long been controlled by corrupt machines. Then there was the Western wing of the party. For these Democrats, farm issues were absolutely paramount. Agricultural issues were huge in the 1920s. Subsidies, the price of grain at home and overseas, and especially the availability of money and credit to purchase new farm equipment, which was what a lot of farmers were doing after World War I. Who were the exemplars of this wing of the party? Well, the Bryan brothers, of course, not just William Jennings, but his brother, Charles Bryan, who in 1924 was governor of Nebraska. And finally, there was the Southern Wing. Southern Democrats of the 1920s 
tended to be fundamentalist Christians, always Protestants, never Catholics, and the maintenance of the brutal Jim Crow system of segregation and white supremacy was their paramount issue. A good example of this kind of Democrat was Carter Glass, senator from Virginia, whose head could occasionally be turned by progressive policies. He supported the Federal Reserve, for example, but his big thing was perpetuating segregation. The Southern and Western wings of the party had a huge problem in 1924. They were heavily infiltrated by the Ku Klux Klan, a racist terrorist group. I'll get to that issue in just a moment. But before we get there, it's important to note the biggest issue that was pulling these three wings of the parties apart. It wasn't race, it was booze. Yes, prohibition. This is why I said earlier it was in many ways the most important issue. The northern eastern wing generally didn't like prohibition. They were wets in the parlance of the times. A little drink never hurt anyone, according to these people. Later in life, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a huge fan of martinis, and he didn't start drinking them in 1933, let me tell you. The western wing was generally dry. They were, after all, good churchgoers. The famous painting American Gothic, created in 1930, is so resonant because it perfectly captures these kinds of people. They heavily favored prohibition, but remember, farm issues were most important to them. The southern wing was fanatically dry. Prohibition started in many areas of the South and even persisted long after it was repealed on the national level. I get angry comments whenever I mention anything from my own life in these videos, but I'll just drop the fact that I had to join a quote-unquote private club to get a beer at an Iron Maiden concert in Dallas in 1999. That's a relic of Prohibition. To give you a historical example of how divisive the Prohibition issue was, take William Jennings Bryan, the old progressive crusader. He was mysteriously absent from the 1920 campaign, despite still being around and prominent in national politics. Why? Well, because the Democratic presidential nominee in 1920, James Cox, was perceived as a wet, despite the fact that he actually supported the Volstead Act. And Bryan and his cronies thought this was the vanguard of a hostile takeover of his Democratic Party by those evil northern and eastern liquor guzzlers, so he refused to campaign for Cox. Considering that the next Democratic president was that notorious martini drinker that I mentioned earlier, Bryan might have had a point. Okay, let's talk about the Klan. The first thing to understand is that the Ku Klux Klan of the 1920s was not the self-same organization that had arisen in the South following the Civil War, principally to terrorize African Americans and prevent them from voting. The 1920s Klan had the same name and obviously claimed themselves as the modern reincarnation of that terrorist group, but there is not an unbroken continuity between the 1860s Klan and the 1920s version or, for that matter, the clan that exists today. Historians distinguish between the first clan, the second clan, and the third clan. We're talking here about the second one. The second one was founded in 1915 by a man called William Joseph Simmons in Atlanta. It was sparked by the release of a movie, D.W. Griffith's notorious hate crime of a motion picture, Birth of a Nation, which popularized the image, not an accurate portrayal of the 1860s clan, as going around in white robes and burning crosses. Simmons was ousted as leader of the terrorist group by Hiram Evans, a dentist from Dallas, in 1922. Notably, Evans turned the Klan into a business. It was an official fraternal organization, and members had to pay $10 to join, making Evans quite rich. He later lost everything in the Great Depression. The groups of people the second clan hated was far more diverse than the targets of the 1860s version. They hated, terrorized, and lynched African Americans, naturally. But in the early 1920s, Catholics, Jews, communists, and liberals of any stripe were counted among the clan's enemies. But especially Catholics. The clan tapped into the age-old conspiracy theory that all Catholics in America were radio-controlled by the Pope and would destroy Protestantism as soon as orders were transmitted from the Vatican. Committing acts of terrorism on a local level was not at the top of the clan's priority list. Under the leadership of Evans, they wanted, above all, to become a legitimate political force in America. 
To this end, it's important to note that the second Klan was bipartisan. You didn't just find it among Democrats. The Klan tried to infiltrate whatever political party was most dominant in a particular area. Though the strongest base of the Klan's support was in the South and West, predominantly rural areas that were more traditionally Democratic, in Illinois and Ohio, the Klan skewed heavily Republican, and it almost completely took over the Indiana Republican Party. But because Republicans in the 1920s were mostly dominated by business and corporate interests, who were more united by money issues than about which kinds of people they hated, the Klan's footprint within the Democratic Party as a whole was bigger than it was among Republicans. So what about prohibition? Well, where do you think the Klan stood on that issue? They were as dry as the Atacama Desert. And as the leading candidate among the northern eastern urban wing of the Democratic Party was Al Smith, who was both wet and Catholic, you can already see how this is going to lead to considerable problems when it comes time for the Democratic Party to choose a presidential candidate. The group of potential candidates who started jockeying for position in early 1924 was a rogues gallery. We've met some of them already. There was William Gibbs McAdoo, Woodrow Wilson's son-in-law. McAdoo did not hold public office in 1924 and had moved recently to California to cultivate his political career. He was dry and very much opposed to the big urban political machines like Tammany Hall in New York City. Thus, he could be expected to be acceptable to the southern and western wings of the party, two out of three, which was why he was the presumed frontrunner. McAdoo had a big problem. One of his closest friends, donors, and clients was Edward Doheny, a California oil man who was closely associated with the Teapot Dome scandal. As the details of what had gone on around Teapot Dome seeped into newspapers in 1923 and 24, this reflected badly on McAdoo. The Klan was also a problem for him. McAdoo refused to denounce them. Still, going into 1924, he was as well positioned as anyone. Al Smith, governor of New York, was a committed progressive, having come to power in part because of his critical role in the aftermath of the horrific 1911 Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, which jump-started a major overhaul of workplace safety regulations in New York. Smith was pro-labor, pro-immigrant, and pro-alcohol. He was an outspoken opponent of lynching and racial violence, which put him on the wrong side of the Klan, not that they would ever have supported him anyway. Smith wanted to be the first major party nominee who was Catholic. He eventually was, though not this time around. Smith's mini-me shadow and junior varsity understudy was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who had been the vice presidential nominee in 1920. FDR had fallen on hard times, though. In 1921, after swimming at his vacation estate, Campobello in Nova Scotia, this is it here, Roosevelt contracted polio, usually a child's disease, and was disabled. His long road to recovery, physically, psychologically, and politically, would bring him to the 1924 Democratic Convention, as we'll see. FDR was not a serious candidate for president in 1924, but his mentor Al Smith was the next most powerful frontrunner after McAdoo. James Cox, former governor of Ohio, was like McAdoo out of office when the 1924 season rolled around. It's not clear exactly how serious Cox was about being a candidate again. He and FDR were utterly clowned in the 1920 election, and he would face the same problems a second time around, prohibition, namely. But Cox hovered in the background as a possible compromised candidate, if no one else could go the distance. There wasn't much enthusiasm about him, though. Oscar Underwood, senator from Alabama, had been Senate minority leader up until the end of 1923. If you see senator from Alabama and assume that this guy was the Klan's preferred candidate, you'd be wrong. Underwood hated the Klan, and he denounced it publicly, one of the few Southern Democrats willing to do so. He was also identified with various progressive causes, having his name on the Congressional Act that eventually put the modern income tax into practice in 1913, though he had staunchly opposed women's suffrage. Underwood's problem politically was that he appealed to both too many constituencies in the party and too few. The Klan people would never accept him, of course, but other Southerners might. 
He was personally wet, but might conceivably appeal to Dries because of his strong stance that states should decide such things. He did have the support of a lot of ex-Wilson operatives in the party, at least the ones that weren't enamored with McAdoo. Samuel Ralston, senator from Indiana, also had a little bit to tempt everybody, but some problems too. He was dry, he had supported Wilson's League of Nations idea, and he was thought of as solidly middle of the road. Not too progressive, not too conservative. Because of a controversy back in Indiana over state-supported parochial schools, Ralston had come down in favor of the Klan's preferred position. This meant that he was their preferred candidate in 1924, but that also meant he was toxic to various other parts of the party, especially the Northern Eastern Wing. If Ralston could get the nomination, it could only be through a last man standing type of strategy. I already mentioned Carter Glass of Virginia, fiercely pro-segregation, a staunch Methodist and very much in favor of prohibition, he could be counted on to attract the Klan vote. But he also passed as the senior statesman in the Democratic camp. He had been Secretary of the Treasury after McAdoo under Wilson, and in fact, Glass himself supported McAdoo. Glass was a potential backup choice and a dark horse if the convention deadlocked. A very short man with a big nose and red hair, cartoonists often made fun of him. He was so straight-laced that the strongest curse words he ever uttered were, Dad, bum it! Finally, there was John W. Davis of West Virginia, a true dark horse. No one really thought of him as an A-lister for the presidency, but his credentials were pretty good. He was a second-generation lawyer and was more comfortable in law than politics, though he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1910. When Wilson came to power, though, the new president appointed Davis Solicitor General of the United States, essentially the federal government's trial lawyer. As such, he argued over 60 cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court and seemed destined to sit on that bench eventually. Then Wilson threw a monkey wrench into that plan by appointing Davis, just after World War I, as American ambassador to the U.K. Davis didn't want the job, but he felt duty-bound to take it. When he returned to the U.S. in 1921, he restarted his law practice and quickly grew wealthy, representing big corporations, oil companies, and financial interests, including the companies of J.P. Morgan, which not everybody in the Democratic Party liked. Davis was well known to political people, but had virtually no name recognition among the general public. There were primaries in the Democratic Party in 1924. As I said earlier, primaries did exist at this time, but they weren't the major means of picking up delegates for the national conventions. McAdoo, however, decided to go all in on the primaries, hoping that strong showings there would demonstrate his viability as a candidate when factions battled it out at the convention. Twelve Democratic states held primaries in early 1924. McAdoo ran away with most of them, placing strong in the West and South, as everyone expected. But, as you know, primaries at this time were not that important. The real battle for the 1924 Democratic nomination would kick off in New York in June. It would prove way more tumultuous and difficult than anyone expected. That's in Chapter 6. But before we get there, let's meet the others who were running for president that year. They're important, trust me. As there always are, in 1924 there were third parties and other potential candidates, some of them simply attention seekers, who were in fairly distant orbit around the solar system of electoral politics. That is, with the exception of the major third party candidate, who I'll get to in a moment. Let's dispose of some of the others fairly quickly. I keep telling you that prohibition was a huge issue in the 20s, and a lot of people were very serious about it. For the non-drinkers of America, for whom the Democratic Party's southern and western wings just weren't fanatical enough about the issue, they fortunately had an alternative, the Prohibition Party, founded in 1869 and which still exists today. The Prohibition Party had fielded an official presidential and vice presidential nominee in every election since 1872. During the Progressive Era, they had some electoral success, not on the presidential level, obviously, but one of their candidates, Los Angeles newspaper man Charles Hiram Randall, did serve in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1915 to 1921. He voted against U.S. entry into World War I, for the record. 
You'd expect the Prohibition Party to have disbanded in triumph in 1919 when the 18th Amendment got passed. Well, they didn't. Now they were pledged to strong enforcement of prohibition, and in 1924 they were unwilling to trust their signature issue to the Democrats, or the Republicans for that matter. Herman Ferris, a banker from Clinton, Missouri, who had been a Republican until he joined the Prohibition Party in the 1880s, had long campaigned tirelessly against the demon rum. After trying unsuccessfully for the vice presidential nomination in 1920, four years later, the way was clear for him to be the Prohibition Party's presidential candidate. Just as ardent prohibitionists didn't trust the two major parties to carry their banner, there were people for whom the two major parties simply weren't racist enough. In 1924, there was a short-lived party called the American Party. Same name, but not the same organization as the fairly major party that ran candidates in the 1850s, which had been known as the Know Nothings. This new American Party held a convention too, nominating anti-Catholic judge Gilbert Nations for president. The American Party hoped to garner support from the Ku Klux Klan, most of the Klansmen active in 1924 thought it more productive to try to influence the Democratic nomination rather than bank on Gilbert Nations, so he was essentially an also-ran. Moving now from the far right to the far left, and eventually the not-so-far left, the late teens and early 20s were the high watermark for organized socialist and communist political activity in America, and the history of this is extremely complicated. While it's not accurate to ignore the distinctions between these groups and parties, a socialist and a communist, for example, are two different things, there was considerable fluidity between politicians and political allies on the left, as they supported and often fell out with each other to try to make political and electoral gains. Eugene Debs, who came up earlier, was the Socialist Party candidate for president in several elections. In 1920, he was in prison for sedition, having spoken out against the draft in World War I. In late 1921, President Harding commuted Debs' sentence. Debs' health was ruined, though, during his time in prison, and it didn't look likely that he would be a political force in 1924. Debs had been a prominent member of the Socialist Party of America. There was considerable turmoil in this party, sparked mostly by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Within the Socialist Party, there was a faction known as the left-wing section. In 1919, Lenin and the Bolsheviks invited the left-wing section, but not the entirety of the Socialist Party of America, to join the Common Turn, an international coalition of parties that was effectively the arm of the Bolsheviks that sought to export the Russian Revolution to the rest of the world. The Socialist Party of America saw itself as more mainstream and moderate than what they viewed as the radical leftists who supported the Bolsheviks. Consequently, the left wing split off from the Socialist Party, and then itself split into two parties, the Communist Party of America and Communist Party USA, who were bitter rivals. The split in the far American left and the formation of these parties and splinter parties incidentally is depicted in the 1981 film Reds, directed by Warren Beatty, who portrayed John Reed, an American communist who participated in these events and who witnessed the Bolshevik Revolution. Long story short, the presidential nominee of the Communist Party USA in 1924 was William Foster, sometimes known as William Z. Foster, a longtime labor organizer who spent much of his career sparring and competing with other figures on the left. But by a wide margin, the potential third-party candidate that had the biggest chance to make a difference was technically a Republican, Robert La Follette, senator from Wisconsin. La Follette was truly one of the pillars of the whole progressive era. He was a more or less doctrinaire Republican when first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1884, one of the youngest members of Congress at that time. He seemed to be destined for a career in politics as usual. Then, in 1891, one of Wisconsin's sitting senators, Philita Sawyer, attempted to bribe La Follette to influence his brother-in-law, a judge who was presiding over a corruption case. La Follette made the bribe attempt public. This precipitated a split between La Follette and the rest of Wisconsin's Republican Party, and also propelled La Follette into the realm of progressivism. From that point on, La Follette was a tireless champion of progressive causes, and deliberately made himself irritating to traditional politicians of his state, whom he regarded as corrupt. After three tries at the office, La Follette became governor of Wisconsin in 1901, and immediately started to clean house. 
He fought for electoral reform, instituting a primary system in Wisconsin elections. Also tax reform, which meant that the burden of taxation fell heavily on railroad interests, who, and whose corporate donors and patron politicians, most of them Republicans, came to regard Bob La Follette as one of their biggest enemies in America. Once he got into the U.S. Senate in 1906, La Follette truly kicked into high gear. Tax reform, banking reform, anti-corruption, trust busting, feminism, women's suffrage, gender equality. La Follette ordered basically the whole menu of progressive programs and pushed them relentlessly. One of La Follette's main tacks was to make democracy more democratic. He favored direct election of the president, essentially abolishing the electoral college, an idea that's still being discussed a hundred years later. He wanted federal judges to be elected, an open primary system, and eventually, after America's experience in World War I, a popular referendum on going to war. He made enemies of Theodore Roosevelt and William Taft, and as you might imagine, especially of Woodrow Wilson. La Falla was an outspoken opponent of American entry into World War I, believing that it was a war mainly to enrich wealthy plutocrats on both sides of the Atlantic. La Falla was also something of a self-promoter. He really wanted to be president of the United States. If he was to have a shot at the big chair, it was probably in 1912. Incumbent President Taft was weak, and the Republicans split by the candidacy of Roosevelt, and Wilson, on the Democratic side, had his own problems. Unfortunately, La Follette blew himself up together with his potential candidacy in a disastrous speech he gave at the Philadelphia Periodical Publishers Banquet in February 1912. He meant to rail against corporate influence in print media, and he did, but his speech, which got started at 11 p.m., was two and a half hours long, and La Follette yelled at members of the audience who got up to walk out. Woodrow Wilson was in the room. The speech and La Follette's behavior were so bad that the chairman of the banquet got up and apologized to the crowd when it was over. There was talk of La Follette having suffered a nervous breakdown. He might have done so. He did tend to work himself to exhaustion and was under great emotional strain at the time. In any event, Bob La Follette was not going to be elected president in 1912. His Philadelphia pooch screw was the 19-teens equivalent to the famous Dean scream of 2004, one mistake that quite possibly changed American history. Ah! In 1916, La Follette was focused on re-election to the Senate. Four years later, he had some cachet at the 1920 convention, but by that time the Republicans were so dominated by conservative elements in the party that he had little chance of attracting support on a progressive platform. Moreover, La Follette had supported the Russian Revolution and was denounced on the 1920 convention floor as a Bolshevik. Like many on the left, La Falla was challenged by the revolution. Many American progressives did support it at the time, before the true nature of the communist regime became well known around the world. But in the fall of 1923, still serving in the Senate, La Follette visited Soviet Russia to see for himself and was immediately disillusioned by the repressive tendencies in the one-party rule of the Bolsheviks, and he ultimately denounced them. La Falla returned to the United States after his European tour in poor health. He was taking nitroglycerin pills for a heart condition, and he had frequent morphine shots for chronic pain. In early 1924, Robert La Follette was 69 years old. He seemed aware that he was probably nearing the end of his life. He told his son, quote, I don't want to, I just can't live rolled up in a cotton blanket in a damned wheelchair. I want to die as I have lived, with my boots on. So, for fighting Bob La Follette, there would be one more campaign, and the reasons for it were possibly more personal than political. While he never slackened in his support for progressive causes that he'd championed for most of his political life, in a sense, the 1924 campaign was not so much a serious attempt at the presidency as it was a greatest hits farewell tour of his political life and legacy. As a Republican, it was pointless for La Follette to try to horn in on the convention that would certainly nominate Coolidge. Most Republicans hated him anyway. So, in the spring of 1924, La Follette's boosters went around the country gaining petition signatures, urging him to run as an independent. He specifically did not want to try to start a third party, which would have the responsibility of fostering local and statewide tickets that they would have to support. La Follette wanted the spotlight to be firmly on himself. A group called the Conference for Progressive Political Action, essentially a coalition of labor unions and other pro-labor groups, 
had been founded in 1922 to try to coordinate political action across the country to benefit the working class. Now, it's important to note that the CPPA was not a political party. In fact, some of its member organizations were small political parties. Yet, behaving very much like it was a political party, the CPPA scheduled a national convention for Cleveland on July 4, 1924, not long after the Democrats began their convention in New York City. La Follette's political forces, mainly his sons and a group of Wisconsin progressive activists long involved in his campaigns, wrote letters and cemented alliances to try to arrange the CPPA convention as a launching pad for La Follette's campaign, in which he would try to unite progressives existing across the Democratic and Republican parties. The CPPA convention was held here at the Public Hall, now called the Public Auditorium in Cleveland. About 1,200 delegates were present and 9,000 spectators. There were representatives of the NAACP, labor unions, church groups, women's suffrage organizations, business organizations, and a surprising number of young people. Yes, there was a youth movement in the 1920s, and despite his age, La Follette was clearly their candidate. Bob La Follette did not attend the convention himself. A statement from him announcing his willingness to run for president was read to the convention by his son, Bob La Follette Jr., later in life to become a prominent politician in his own right. On July 5th, the CPPA convention nominated La Follette by acclamation. The vice presidential nomination went to Burton Wheeler, a senator from Montana, a Democrat. Historians generally hold that the progressive era ended with World War I, but La Follette seems not to have gotten that memo. Numerous stars of the progressive movement of the past 30 years endorsed his candidacy, including Jane Addams, founder of Hull House, African-American activist W.E.B. Du Bois, feminist and activist for the disabled Helen Keller, educator John Dewey, judge, later Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, and future New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Though his record on progressive issues was very strong, politically the best thing about La Follette's candidacy was that it was the only real viable alternative to the major party candidates. As we'll see, there wasn't a lot of difference between the Democratic and Republican candidates and their platforms. La Follette, though, was a true third option, and he had national name recognition. And, if not really a chance to win, given the dynamics of the two-party system, he could certainly shake up the race. While La Follette was cruising to nomination by the CPPA on July 5th, 1924, the sordid drama of the Democratic Convention was still going on. That story, one of the central events of the 1924 election saga, is the subject of the next chapter. On June 24, 1924, the Democratic National Convention opened at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Before I get to the politics of the convention itself, it's worth saying a few words about the physical space that it happened in. The venue was not the Madison Square Garden of today. It was the second event space built in New York with that name, constructed in 1890. Once the most beautiful building in New York, the garden had a 32-story tower modeled after Seville Cathedral in Spain. But by 1924, the building had seen better times. Antiquated and dilapidated, it was already scheduled for demolition at the time the convention convened. In fact, the convention was to be the last major event there before the wrecking ball went to work. The last event before the Democratic convention was a run of the Barnum and Bailey Circus, full of straw and wild animals, and the place had to be cleaned thoroughly before the delegates started arriving. The convention was unusual for 1920s politics because all of the major candidates, except Samuel Ralston, were actually there. Most of the time, candidates stayed away and left the dirty work to their subordinates. Hotels across the city were full. And it was hot. Built as it was in a time before air conditioning, in hot weather, Madison Square Garden became like a steam bath. Considering most of the men were wearing wool suits, you can get an idea of how uncomfortable it was. There were women delegates present, reflecting the new reality of the 19th Amendment. In fact, McAdoo's handlers had come up with a group of women from California, his home state, who were supposed to cheer and go crazy whenever his name was mentioned. There were women in various other delegations, too. But beyond this, the 1924 Democratic Convention was not very diverse. It was, for example, 100% white. Not only was that not a good look, 
it didn't bode well for what eventually happened. The biggest issue at the convention, potentially even bigger than who was going to go up against Coolidge in the fall, was the Klan, and whether the convention as a whole, or its eventual candidate, would denounce them specifically and by name. The day before the convention started, Oscar Underwood, senator from Alabama, you recall he was vehemently anti-Klan, promised publicly that he would introduce a plank in the Democratic platform which would condemn the KKK by name. Many of the other candidates, most in fact, except Al Smith, were not eager to have that fight. McAdoo in particular feared that if he was nominated, which he expected to be, he couldn't win without support from the Klan in the South and West. As a political candidate, if you need supporters of a racist terrorist group to win an election, that should make you seriously question your choices in life. But setting aside that issue, most of the other candidates and political bosses gathering in New York, even if they were opposed to the Klan, feared that calling them out by name would just draw attention to them, and how much sway they thought they had in certain segments of the party. The convention had three major phases. First was sort of a show where del states' delegations declared who they were for and officially placed the names of their favorites in contention for the nomination. This would involve a lot of speeches and grandstanding. The second phase was where the convention would work out the details of their platform. The third phase was the actual balloting. All three phases were destined to provoke controversy over the Klan issue. On the afternoon of June 25th, during the first phase, a delegate called Forney Johnson from Washington gave a speech officially placing Oscar Underwood's name in contention. Predictably, in his speech, Johnson called for a plank in the platform condemning the Klan. Pandemonium broke out on the floor of the garden. Some delegates cheered raucously, others booed, shouted insults, and rioted. For 25 minutes, people fought, grabbed flags and banners, ripped each other's clothes, and generally ran amok. Finally, order was restored, but reporters were already filing stories about what a mess the convention was destined to be. The next day, June 26, it was the turn of the New York delegation, which would officially put forward Al Smith for nomination. This was one of the very few high points of the convention. The nomination speech was to be given by Smith's mini-me protege, Franklin Roosevelt. This was FDR's first major political appearance since his polio attack. Though he was observed in a wheelchair on the platform while waiting to be announced, he stood up and walked to the platform to give his speech. The hall, heavily packed with hometown Smith supporters, roared in applause. Of course, FDR's quote-unquote walking was something of an illusion. Using rigid leg braces that came up to his hips and leaning on the arm of his 17-year-old son on his way up to the podium, Roosevelt gave the appearance of walking and standing, but with great effort. Though the fact that he'd been paralyzed from polio was not a secret, newspapers in 1924, and generally throughout the rest of Roosevelt's life, usually didn't show pictures of him in a wheelchair, and tended to refer to his disability in print only lightly and obliquely. The second phase of the convention, the platform, was already going on. At that time, a committee of party planners was meeting in the Rose Room of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, bashing each other to bits, rhetorically speaking, over the three main issues of contention, which were, in reverse alphabetical order, Prohibition, the League of Nations, and the KKK. The problem was, especially regarding the Klan plank, the representatives of the major candidates, as well as William Jennings Bryan, who was working behind the scenes, there was no permutation of it that the committee could be sure would be acceptable to each of the three main wings of the party. You could get two out of three, but not all three. This was the fundamental problem with the convention for everything. Ultimately, the committee just threw up their hands. They simply could not find a compromise. They punted the issue of a Klan plank to the full convention. The convention had a choice between a fairly bland statement that, quote, condemned any efforts to arouse religious or racial dissension, that was the majority, the main or majority plank, or they could choose a minority plank, which was that wording with a sentence added, quote, we condemn political secret societies of all kinds and pledge the Democratic Party to oppose any effort on the part of the Ku Klux Klan or any organization to interfere with the religious liberty or political freedom of any citizen or to limit the civic rights of any citizen because of religion, birthplace, or racial origin, 
end quote. In other words, the convention had to choose between a plank that offered mild condemnation of the kind of crap the Klan did without specifically mentioning them, or a more specific condemnation that called them out by name. Punting this issue to the floor was about the worst thing the party bosses could have done. It turned the whole convention into a circus. When, when the suggestion of condemning the KKK specifically by name was read aloud, the whole floor fell into chaos again. Debate on the issue, officially called for by the convention rules, meant that whoever rose to speak on the proposal, whatever they said, would trigger an uproar with both pro- and anti-Klan delegates and spectators trolling and shouting at each other. The biggest demonstration came when William Jennings Bryan, Democratic nominee from 1896, 1900, and 1908, spoke on the question. Bryan was not explicitly pro-Klan, but he wanted the majority option, the plank that condemned what the Klan did without naming them. In his speech, he suggested, why don't we just strike out those three words, Ku Klux Klan? Keeping alcohol illegal and promoting religious fundamentalism were much more important issues to Bryan, and he saw the Klan issue as a distraction. He barely got to finish his speech because of all the shouting, heckling, and cheering. What was worse, he was the last speaker. The convention would start voting on the minority plank as soon as he sat down and shut up, if he ever did. While Brian was speaking, the call went out to police headquarters to send a thousand extra police with full riot gear to Madison Square Garden to keep order, a rather ominous development. For the next two hours, the floor of the garden was a riot scene. Delegates engaged in open brawls and fistfights. Spectators in the galleries howled and stamped their feet like they were watching pro wrestling. Bigots shouted racial epithets, and others shouted counter insults at the racists. There was supposed to be a roll call vote going on among the state delegations, but there was so much pandemonium that it was hard to get an accurate count of what the delegation's votes actually were. At long last, the votes were tallied. Now, before I tell you what they were, I need to explain that the convention was not one delegate, one vote. States had a specific number of votes allocated to their delegations as a whole, and that number of votes did not necessarily correlate with how many people were in their delegations. This often resulted in fractions of votes being counted. For example, if Delaware was allocated five votes and there were 10 people in its delegation, and five of those people voted for Proposal A, and the other five for Proposal B, Delaware's official vote would be two and a half votes for A, and two and a half votes for B. So you see how this works. Here was the final tally on the proposal to condemn the KKK by name. When everything was counted, the votes in favor were 541 and 3 twentieths. The votes opposing it were, wait for it, 542 and 3 twentieths. The KKK condemnation plank had failed by exactly one vote. The fight over the Klan plank doomed the rest of the convention. It essentially made compromise between the McAdoo and Smith delegations impossible. While Smith had lobbied to support the condemnation plank, McAdoo had tried to stay out of it, going so far as to shut himself up in his hotel room at the Vanderbilt Hotel and taking the phone off the hook. As you recall, McAdoo needed the votes of racist Klan sympathizers if he was going to have any chance of winning. Fans of Al Smith were convinced that McAdoo was the Klan's candidate, and he might as well have come to the convention in a white sheet and pointy hood. McAdoo's supporters were pissed off that Smith's New York friends had made such a big deal of the Klan vote, and as Smith was both Catholic and wet, two things they tended to hate, there would be no compromising with him. Oh, I should mention that this ugly drama was being broadcast live over the radio airwaves. The 1924 Democratic Convention was the first political convention to be heavily covered by radio. Americans who had radio sets, a growing number in the mid-20s, were sitting by them listening to announcers narrate these developments blow by blow. The Klan fight was the biggest news of the weekend, dominating the headlines. So now, with this unbelievable racist mess behind them, the 1924 Democratic Convention headed into its third and most bruising phase, the balloting. If you want to step out and get some popcorn before we get there, this might be a good time. <music> to understand the utter disaster that the balloting process of the 1924 Democratic National Convention was, you have to understand something about the rules. 
there were a total of 1,098 official votes up for grabs. As I explained in the last chapter, that did not necessarily correlate to the actual number of people who had delegate credentials, which is how we get fractional votes. It was a mess. For official nomination, a candidate had to get 732 votes, two-thirds, and this was called the two-thirds rule. You also needed the same number of votes, 732, or two-thirds, to change the rules. Both of these became important later. There was also another rule called the unit rule, which was in effect in some states, but not others. Essentially, it was a winner-take-all type of thing, where a state's delegation, however many votes they had, had to cast all of their votes for the candidate who got a majority of the votes within their own delegation. So again, using Delaware as a hypothetical example with easy numbers, if they had five votes in 10 delegates and six of the 10 voted for Al Smith and Delaware was using the unit rule, Delaware would cast five votes for Al Smith. Please don't ask me what would have happened if there was a tie. I've got a headache already. Essentially, you can put the candidates into two groups. There were the obvious front runners, the big dogs, McAdoo and Smith. Then beneath them were a group we can call the favorite sons. These were the other candidates with smaller bases of support, usually enthusiastically supported by their home states, with some but not a lot of appeal to others. Basically everyone else, Underwood, Ralston, the Davises, etc. were in this favorite son category. I'm not going to go through the results of every single ballot at the convention. There were just too many of them. But here are the highlights. The divisive vote on the Klan plank had occurred on Saturday night, June 28, 1924. On Sunday, the convention was in recess. They started up again on Monday morning, June 30th. Everyone knew it was going to be a slog. The first ballot was basically to gauge where everybody was. Because the votes were tallied by a public roll call, each state in alphabetical order, Alabama was always the first one called. And as you recall, Alabama had a favorite son in the mix, Oscar Underwood. So every time their state was called, the chairman of the Alabama delegation, Governor William Brandon, called out, Alabama cast 24 votes for Oscar W. Underwood. The convention heard this phrase so much that people began making a joke of it, and reporters imitated it on the radio. So, first vote. Here's how it shook out. McAdoo, 431 and a half. Smith, 241. James Cox, 59. Oscar W. Underwood, 42 and a half. George Sebastian Silzer, governor of New Jersey, 38. John W. Davis of West Virginia, 31. Woodbridge Ferris, governor of Michigan, 30. Samuel Ralston, 30. Carter Glass, Mr. Dad Bummett, 25. Albert C. Ritchie, Governor of Maryland, 22 and a half. Joe T. Robinson, Senator from Arkansas, 21. Jonathan Davis, lead singer of the new metal band Korn, sorry, I meant Governor of Kansas, 20. Not to be confused with John W. Davis of West Virginia. Charles W. Bryan, William Jennings' brother, 18. Fred H. Brown, Governor of New Hampshire, 17. And bringing up the rear, Willard Salisbury, Delaware lawyer and former U.S. Senator, 7. The votes for McAdoo and Smith, the frontrunners, correlated closely with how delegates had voted on the proposed Klan plank. Almost all the delegates who voted for McAdoo had voted against the condemnation of the Klan. Conversely, almost all the delegates who voted for Smith had voted for the condemnation of the Klan. So you see where this is going. McAdoo, though short of a majority, much less a two-thirds supermajority, which is what he needed, was still confident. Slightly less than 100 votes ahead of Smith, McAdoo expected the convention would move steadily in his direction, especially after the first of the favorite sons to drop out, Woodbridge Ferris, went home with his chariot full of nothing. That is not what happened. The ninth ballot, taken at the end of the day session, showed that very little had changed. The evening session didn't get much better. By the time the convention adjourned for the day at 11.35 p.m., there had been 30 ballots. No real change, except Jonathan Davis dropped out, but it didn't make much of a difference. By Wednesday, the third day of balloting, it was clear that neither McAdoo nor Smith could defeat the other, and neither would give up. William Jennings Bryan, whose speech on the Klan issue had incited a riot a few days earlier, got up to speak again. 
he thought he was giving an eloquent address appealing for harmony in the Democratic Party. But throughout the speech, he was shouted at and heckled. At the end of his speech, Bryan endorsed McAdoo, whose supporters, including the wailing women, went nuts, while most others booed and hissed. Opponents of McAdoo, who were usually fans of Al Smith, chanted, Oil! Oil! whenever his name was mentioned, a dig intended to highlight McAdoo's close ties to figures implicated in the Teapot Dome scandal. It was clear that William Jennings Bryan, however much of a hero he'd been in 1896, was, by 1924, mostly a joke. There was slow movement toward McAdoo. On the 40th ballot, he managed to score 505 and a half votes, the first time over 500, but still not a majority and far below two-thirds. The problem was that the delegates who supported the favorite Sun candidates kept doing it. Even as some minor candidates dropped out, their votes usually got evenly split between McAdoo and Smith, so neither made headway against the other. The convention wore on. No one had expected it would stretch into the 4th of July holiday, but there they still were, taking ballot after ballot. They were now in the 60s, and nothing had really changed. By now, some delegates who could no longer afford to stay in their expensive New York hotel rooms gave up and went home, turning over their credentials to alternates. McAdoo, in fact, even criticized Al Smith for deliberately dragging on the convention so that out-of-town delegates who'd traveled the farthest to get there from the West, which generally supported McAdoo, would have to go home because they were financially exhausted. William Jennings Bryan suggested setting up a fund to pay delegates hotel bills. Then Smith got pissed, claiming that McAdoo was trying to bribe the delegates by paying their hotel bills. Eventually, William Randolph Hearst paid into the fund, which was doled out anonymously. On July 4th, in Long Branch, New Jersey, 20,000 members of the Ku Klux Klan and their supporters held a march specifically to bag on Al Smith. At the march, the KKK set up an effigy of Smith, a whiskey bottle in the dummy's hand to symbolize Smith's opposition to prohibition, and they charged people five cents a shot to throw baseballs at the dummy. A Klan spokesman said that the ongoing convention would not possibly be so foolish as to nominate a Catholic for president. Ballot number 77, the last ballot taken on Saturday, July 5th. McAdoo, 513. Smith, 367. John W. Davis, rising to the top of the favorite son category, 76 and a half. Underwood, 47 and a half. Glass, 27. Robinson, 24. Ritchie, 16 and a half. Smith couldn't win, but it was abundantly clear that he could and would prevent McAdoo from getting the nomination. Saturday night, after the convention adjourned for the day, McAdoo finally caved, partially. He agreed to talks with representatives of all the candidates. This Harmony Conference would essentially be a smoke-filled room, exactly the arrangement from 1920 that many Democrats had criticized Republicans for. The Harmony Conference accomplished diddly squat. There was a proposal to release all delegates from their pledges so they could vote their consciences, but McAdoo blew it up by suggesting instead that the convention scrap both the two-thirds rule and the unit rule, which was not going to happen because, as you recall, you also needed two-thirds to change the rules. The failure of this proposal, however, marked a turning point for McAdoo. He started losing ground steadily. Most of the votes that drained away from him went to Samuel Ralston. As the number of ballots climbed in the high 80s, on Tuesday, July 8th, it looked for a while like Ralston was building momentum. But then he blew that up, not only by dropping out, but by telling the convention chair that he absolutely would not accept the nomination. Samuel Ralston, 66 in 1924, weighed over 300 pounds and had heart trouble. His doctors had strongly advised him against the strain of a national political campaign. His wife and his son were also ill at the same time. Ralston at home in Indiana looking after them. He was, as you recall, the only major candidate not in New York. He had to send several telegrams refusing the nomination over and over again until somebody finally got a clue that he really wouldn't do it. On Tuesday evening, July 8th, after the 93rd roll call ballot, Al Smith and William McAdoo finally had a face-to-face -face summit meeting. Incredibly, they never met personally before during the convention until this conference at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. 
They tried to agree on a joint withdrawal and a compromise candidate, with Smith doing most of the conciliating. But McAdoo wouldn't have it. He promised to get back to Smith on the joint withdrawal proposal, and Smith waited at the Manhattan Club to hear from him. He never did. McAdoo ghosted him. McAdoo had now torpedoed two proposals in a row to end this thing. Everybody except his supporters were to was totally disgusted with him. But subtly, the end game was starting to take shape. When it was clear that Ralston meant what he said that he would not be the nominee, some of the delegates who had defected to him started gravitating toward John W. Davis. Between the 94th ballot and the 99th, Davis went from 81 and 3 fourths votes to 210 votes. Infuriatingly, on that same ballot, McAdoo and Smith were tied at 353 votes each. At 2 a.m., it was now Wednesday, July 9th, McAdoo sent a statement down to the convention. He did not withdraw, but instead he released his delegates from their pledges. The 100th ballot was taken. McAdoo still had 190 delegates who refused to give him up, but the rest of his votes mostly went evenly to the favorite sons still in the race. It still wasn't over. Exhausted and demoralized, the chairman of the convention adjourned it for the day at 4 o'clock a.m. This couldn't go on much longer, and everyone knew it. James Cox, governor of Ohio, who had left the convention after he dropped out on ballot number 68, had returned to New York on Monday, and on Wednesday morning, he told the Ohio delegation that they should vote for John W. Davis. Davis might get some votes from both former McAdoo and Smith supporters, but he was toxic because of his status as a high-priced Wall Street lawyer who had represented J.P. Morgan. Nevertheless, somebody had to do something. Word started spreading through the other delegations that Davis might be the answer. When the convention reconvened on the afternoon of Wednesday, July 9th, they took the 101st ballot. Davis, 316. Underwood, 229 and a half. Smith got 121. A movement toward Davis was starting. William Jennings Bryan was horrified, and he told the Mississippi delegation, quote, this convention must not nominate a Wall Street man. Everybody ignored him. On the next ballot, the 102nd, Davis's total went up to 415 and a half. Finally, finally it looked like the thing was going to be over. The dramatic 103rd ballot got started at about 3 in the afternoon. Although Indiana switched to Davis, the real drama got going at the very end of the roll call, when the Washington state delegation gave all of its 14 votes to Davis. He now had a majority, though not two-thirds. However, the chairs of 12 delegations that had already voted clamored to be recognized, and they started changing their votes. Iowa was first, then California, Illinois, and Pennsylvania. Even FDR, a staunch Smith supporter, changed 60 of New York's 90 votes to Davis. The final tally, after a bunch of states changed their votes at the last minute, was 844 for Davis, 102 and a half for Underwood. But it was still not quite over. Now the convention had to pick a vice presidential candidate. Delegates started clamoring for Thomas Walsh, senator from Montana, the chairman of the convention, but he refused the nomination in no uncertain terms. Naturally, the delegates started squabbling again. The squabbling was interrupted by speeches. First, Al Smith, who did not make a good impression, and then Davis himself. It's usually asserted that FDR was the first presidential candidate to accept his nomination by giving a speech in person to a convention in 1932, but actually it was Davis in 1924 who spoke for only eight minutes. After it was over, he abruptly left Madison Square Garden for the Manhattan Club, where, guess what, a smoke-filled room quickly convened to decide the matter of the vice presidential nominee. With a prim and proper Wall Street conservative who was not known to be pro-Klan at the top of the ticket, the best choice, such as it was, seemed to be William Jennings Bryan's brother, Charles. A Westerner, dry, who could at least attract some people who voted on farm issues, it was about the best they could do. After the conference at the Manhattan Club, the convention reconvened at 1.10 a.m. on Thursday, July 10th, and Bryan's name was immediately put in nomination. Bryan was technically nominated on the first ballot, but like Davis's nomination, it only happened at the end when states started changing their votes to him after no less than 13 official candidates 
received votes for vice president. So, even in the end, the 1924 Democratic Convention was a total incompetent mess. At 2.30 a.m. on July 10, 1924, the convention finally adjourned for good, as what few weary delegates who remained that long began filing out of Madison Square Garden, a small group of hecklers began shouting, We want Coolidge! We want Coolidge! Such an ironic end to the most astonishing convention in American political history. In comparison to the incredible slog of the 1924 Democratic Convention, the Republican National Convention that year would have seemed tranquil if anything less than a running gun battle had erupted on the floor of Cleveland's public hall. And while it is true that Coolidge cruised to the nomination without much trouble, the Republicans' gathering was not entirely without incident or controversy. I realize I'm going a little out of sequential order here, but the Republican convention actually occurred before the Democratic one, in early June, and it happened in exactly the same venue where the CPPA would nominate Robert La Follette in early July. The Republican convention kicked off on June 10th. I said in an earlier chapter that the Ku Klux Klan was bipartisan, and the issues involving it plagued Republicans as well as Democrats. While nothing even close to the drama of the proposed KKK condemnation plank at the Democratic Convention happened to the Republicans, the issue did raise its ugly head. One Republican delegate, R.B. Kriegar of Texas, had proposed a plank in the official Republican platform that read, quote, We condemn any or all secret organizations founded on racial or religious intolerance and oppose all secret political societies as being against the spirit of the American people, end quote. Though this proposal didn't call out the Klan by name, as the Democratic proposal did, it was still too much for the KKK. The head of the terrorists, Hiram Evans, actually went to Cleveland during the convention to lobby for the defeat of this proposal. He was successful, with considerably less hoopla than on the Democratic side, and without the bruising ritual of a public vote that forced delegates to take sides, the proposed KKK condemnation plank never made it to a vote of the convention and disappeared without much of a ripple. Thus, of the two major political parties in America, both of them, Democrats and Republicans, refused to denounce the Ku Klux Klan, a racist terrorist organization specifically and by name. The Republicans even refused to denounce them without specifically naming them. President Coolidge was not pro-Klan, far from it. Yet, he did not specifically denounce them either. However, in a somewhat more subtle indication of his views, four days before the convention opened, on June 6, 1924, Coolidge delivered the commencement address at Howard University in Washington, D.C., the first all-black college in the United States. In a subtle dig at the Klan, Coolidge said in this address, speaking of the service of African Americans in the recent World War, quote, the propaganda of prejudice and hatred, which sought to keep the colored men from supporting the national cause, completely failed. Of course, this was talk. What policy was Coolidge willing to champion for the black community? Characteristically, he said nothing about that, or much else. The only real drama at the Republican convention concerned the vice presidential nominee. The names of several candidates were floated, including Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce, who would eventually be the Republican presidential nominee in 1928. Ultimately, the Republican cigar chompers and the delegates united behind Charles Gates Dawes, Harding's former budget director, who was more famous as a diplomat for working out a plan to renegotiate the debts owed by Weimar Germany under the Treaty of Versailles. On the third ballot, Dawes was voted the vice presidential nominee. Neither he nor Coolidge attended the convention in Cleveland. That was customary at the time. Coolidge's easy renomination in June 1924 was the high point of his presidency, and possibly his life. While the sordid drama of the Democratic convention was playing out in New York and over the radio airwaves, a tragedy struck the president and his family. On June 30th, 1924, a Monday, the day that the third phase balloting got underway at the Democratic Convention in New York, Coolidge invited some photographers to the White House to take a bunch of pictures that would be used to publicize his nomination and re-election campaign. 
Among other things, they took some photos of the president with his family, such as this one showing Father Calvin with his sons John, age 17, on the right, and Calvin Jr. on the left, who had just turned 16. Look at the way they're dressed. Wool blazers and slacks, ties, boater hats. This was typical. The president insisted his sons wear tuxedos to dinner, if you can believe it. Anyway, it was hot on June 30th, 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 32.7 Celsius. When they went to play tennis, the White House had a nice set of tennis courts out back, Cal Jr. wasn't wearing socks under his sneakers. They played tennis for a long time. Cal developed a blister on the third toe of his right foot. At first, it was no big deal, but the blister soon became infected. It swelled up and turned black. By the evening of Wednesday, July 2nd, the Democratic Convention was on its 30th through 42nd ballots. Cal was bedridden and very sick. Charles Dawes, Coolidge's running mate, happened to be at the White House that night and witnessed the president bending over his son's bed, a look of agony on his face. Cal Jr.'s condition continued to worsen. On July 5th, while the Democrats were on their 71st through 77th ballots, a decision was made at the White House to take Cal to Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington. The president and Grace Coolidge moved into a small room there to be near him. The infection had spread throughout Cal's body. Sepsis, what was often called blood poisoning, was difficult to treat at this time. Antibiotics, specifically penicillin, were four years away from discovery. At 10.20 p.m. on Monday, July 7th, just a week after the fatal tennis game, Calvin Coolidge Jr. died. The president was holding his son in the last moments of life. Famous for being silent and stoic, there are reports that Calvin Sr. went into such hysterics that he shocked the attending doctors who had never seen such an outpouring of grief. There's absolutely no question that the Coolidges were devoted, loving, and emotional parents. They loved their kids. They were kind, charming, and generous people. While researching this video, I kept noticing images of Calvin and Grace Coolidge playing with their dog, Rob Roy, a white collie. The dog appears in the famous painting of Grace Coolidge, looking like a million bucks. The president was also painted with Rob Roy, the collie. I mention it because the joy on the face of this dog, the joy on the faces of Calvin and Grace shown so rarely in photos when they're with him, is a powerful glimpse of the love that existed in this family, in these people, even if they appeared unemotional to the outside world. There is nothing more devastating emotionally than losing a child. Nothing in the world. President Calvin Coolidge was so emotionally gutted by the death of his son that he was literally never the same man again. After his son's death on July 7, 1924, Coolidge seemed to lose a lot of the interest he had in the job of being president. Formerly quite diligent in his work, there are reports that after Cal's death, he sometimes slept 16 hours a day. He would sit in the Oval Office and stare out the window at the tennis court where his son got his fatal injury. His wife was devastated too. A few years later in his autobiography, published in 1929, Calvin Coolidge spoke of the death of his son and famously wrote, When he died, the power and the glory of the presidency went with him. In New York at the Democratic Convention at 11.45 p.m. on Monday, July 7th, after the 87th roll call vote, Chairman of the convention, Montana Senator Thomas Walsh, read out an announcement to the floor about the death of President Coolidge's son. This was the excuse to adjourn the convention for the night. The next day, July 8th, was the, the beginning of the end game that eventually nominated John W. Davis. Whether as a result of his crushing personal grief, or his usual style, or both, Calvin Coolidge didn't take much of an active role in his own campaign for President of the United States. He wrote letters, gave statements, posed for photographs, and occasionally gave speeches that were less campaign events than vague and general statements on various principles. Such as this one, one of the earliest talking pictures. Here he is talking about government expenditures. Until we can reestablish a condition under which the earnings of the people can be kept by the people, we are bound to suffer a very severe and distinct curtailment of our liberty. Regardless of what one may think about his politics or his legacy as president, you simply can't help feeling charitable toward Calvin Coolidge as a man and as a parent. No one should have to go through what he and his family endured in the summer of 1924.
If the rest of the story of the election of 1924 seems a little anticlimactic, which it probably will, the death of Calvin Coolidge Jr. is a major reason why. If you think the Democrats came out of their disastrous convention in 1924 fatally wounded for the general election, you're right. John W. Davis, the reluctant nominee, knew from the word go that he had no hope whatsoever of beating Coolidge. He doesn't seem even to have wanted to win. If you take into consideration Coolidge's indifference to the race after the death of his son, the 1924 election may be a rare example of a contest in American history in which both the major party candidates secretly wanted the other to win. Davis and the Democrats didn't even have a strategy. With a party so badly fractured, what could he possibly do? Focus on the West, the McAdoo supporters? That would alienate the urban wet Democrats who had wanted Al Smith to be the candidate. But if Davis tried to reach out to them, that would piss off the dry Western farmers, the McAdoo supporters. And could he really sell himself to pro-business conservatives as an alternative to Coolidge? Conservatives were happy with Coolidge. They didn't need an alternative. Davis was doomed no matter what he did. Because he'd never expected to be nominated in the first place and had no national political organization in place, the Davis campaign had to be thrown together quickly and haphazardly after the convention. He did not go to the experts in the established Democratic Party for advice and personnel, people who knew how to wage and potentially win a national campaign. Instead, Davis installed one of his own supporters, a man named Clem Shaver, who had spearheaded Davis's favorite son campaign for the nomination in West Virginia. Shaver turned out to be a terrible campaign manager. He couldn't raise money effectively. He couldn't energize local Democratic organizations. Edward House, known as Colonel House, who had been one of Woodrow Wilson's closest advisors, remarked that Davis's 1924 effort was, quote, the worst managed and most confused campaign that I ever had any knowledge of. Davis himself was no Abraham Lincoln. His official nomination acceptance speech given in Clarksburg, West Virginia on August 11th was a flop. He said most of the right things, but he was an uninspiring speaker and just didn't energize anyone. Furthermore, a few days earlier, Robert La Follette, whose independent candidacy was in full swing, had given a speech denouncing the Ku Klux Klan. More on that in a moment. There were rumors that Coolidge's vice presidential nominee, Charles Dawes, was about to give his own denunciation of the Klan. Newspapers were speculating that progressives, disgusted by the Klan and their antics, would bolt the Democratic Party and vote for La Follette. So Davis was under pressure. Then, on August 20th, 1924, a representative of the Ku Klux Klan in New Jersey, where Davis was campaigning at the time, handed him a letter which offered in no uncertain terms to deliver the entire South for Davis if he remained silent on the issue of the Klan. Davis said to the Klan emissary, is that all? The emissary said yes. Davis, incensed, tore up the letter in front of him and replied, you may say there is no answer. The next day, at Sea Girt on the Jersey Shore, Davis said the following, quote, if any organization, no matter what it chooses to be called, whether it be KKK or any other name, raises the standard of racial and religious prejudices or makes attempts to make racial origins or religious beliefs the test of fitness of public office, it does violence to the spirit of American institutions and must be condemned by all those who believe, as I do, in American ideals." End quote. This wasn't all. For the rest of the campaign, Davis continued to attack the Klan in numerous speeches. Dawes, as it turned out, gave a pretty mealy-mouthed and unconvincing statement against racial prejudice that was considerably milder than anything Davis had said. Coolidge, characteristically, said nothing about anything, much less the Klan. So John Davis, despite his many faults, and there were many, has the distinction of being the presidential candidate in 1924 who went the farthest to denounce the Klan, something that even the Democratic Party had refused to do officially. As for La Follette's statement, while he was unequivocal, he gave it to some degree under duress. His political platform never mentioned the Klan, and he was assiduously silent on it for the first month of his campaign. 
possibly trying to appeal to disaffected McAdoo supporters in the West. But on August 5th, 1924, the newspaper The Irish World finally pressed him for a statement. La Follette said, quote, I am unalterably opposed to the evident purposes of the secret organization known as the Ku Klux Klan as disclosed by its public acts, end quote. For the last valedictory tour of a fiery progressive politician, La Follette's independent campaign was surprisingly limp, though the substance of what he advocated was nothing less than revolutionary. His package of pro-democratic reforms got another airing. He was pro-labor, he wanted cheaper credit and farm subsidies, he wanted to nationalize electricity and the railroads, and all sorts of banking, corporate, and finance reform. Had he been elected and survived, La Follette probably would have enacted the most sweeping political changes in American history. He went on a limited speaking tour, appearing at Madison Square Garden on September 18th, as the venue was being partially dismantled. La Follette's running mate, Burton Wheeler, turned out to be a much more energizing campaigner than La Follette himself, who, as you recall, was in poor health. Wheeler's favorite speech tactic was to put an empty chair on stage and pretend to debate it, referring to it as President Coolidge, highlighting Coolidge's silence. So, those of you who remember Clint Eastwood's bizarre stunt during the 2012 Republican convention, Burton Wheeler did it first. La Follette's campaign, never well funded to begin with, was chronically short on money. Because he decried the influence of corporations and the rich in politics, he didn't get many campaign donations from them. And the voters that he was trying to target, ordinary people who felt pushed around by moneyed interests, didn't have much to give. Administratively, the La Follette campaign couldn't even coordinate how they appeared on the ballots in various states. The candidate's son, Phil La Follette, handled this task, and he did manage to get his dad on the ballot in 47 states, but there was no uniformity on how they appeared. In some states, La Follette was listed as the Socialist Party candidate, which he was not. In others, he was the Farmer Labor Party, which he was not a member of. It was a huge mess. Coolidge and the Republicans mostly ignored John W. Davis. They attacked La Follette, calling him a Bolshevik and a radical. The argument pressed by Charles Dawes, who did most of the campaigning for Republicans in 1924, was that unless there was a strong showing for Coolidge, La Follette would split the vote and throw the election into the House of Representatives, where somehow, apparently using magic powers, they would prevent the House from choosing a president and instead install Charles Bryan, Davis's running mate, as vice president and thus acting president. Despite the fact that this scenario makes absolutely zero sense and could never have happened in the real world, this was the Republicans' closing argument. They probably shouldn't even have bothered. Polling was in its infancy in 1924, but bookmakers were definitely in the business of predicting presidential elections. On the eve of the vote in New York, the odds on Coolidge winning were officially 10 to 1. Part of Davis's problem was that he simply couldn't get Coolidge's attention. In a memoir published years later, John W. Davis said, quote, I did my best to make Coolidge say something. I was running out of anything to talk about. What I wanted was for Coolidge to say something. I didn't care what it was, just so I had someone to debate with. He never opened his mouth, end quote. In some of his speeches, Davis tried to make Coolidge's silence an issue, charging that no matter what was going on, government corruption and scandals, tariffs, corporate greed, League of Nations, the Klan, Coolidge's answer was always silence. Coolidge never rose to the bait. He said, quote, I don't recall any candidate for president that ever injured himself very much by not talking. Even if Davis had been able to get Coolidge to debate him, there wouldn't have been much to talk about. 1924 was an election in which the Republican and Democratic candidates were very similar on almost all major issues. Both were pro-business conservatives. The biggest issue in the 20s, booze, was a loser for Davis. Coolidge didn't have to say much. Prohibition was in effect, as was the Volstead Act enforcing it, and Coolidge's law and order ideals made it clear implicitly that he would abide by it. 
Davis personally was a dry, but he was a bit skittish about the Prohibition Amendment, feeling that the U.S. Constitution was not the means by which to control the morals of Americans. Thus, Wetz didn't like Davis because he was too dry, but dries distrusted him because he didn't really seem like he was on their side. Republican operatives made hay of this. At the Republican rallies in the fall of 1924, there were often signs reading, Davis, wet or dry. Toward the end of the campaign, there was a bizarre incident that almost symbolized the problems of the Davis campaign. On October 19, 1924, Democratic boosters in New York City rented a 50-foot-long blimp on the side of which they painted Davis for president, which they planned to fly over the New York Polo Grounds, a sports venue, during a football game the following Saturday between the Army and Notre Dame. The blimp also ironically advertised Al Smith for governor. The owner of the Polo Grounds, W.G. Coogan, insisted that the blimp wasn't safe. The local Democratic Party insisted that it was, so they decided to have a test flight. The blimp went up, floated around for a while, was seen by an estimated 100,000 people, but then, as they were bringing it down, the blimp crashed into the upper grandstand, tearing a hole in it and starting a fire that destroyed the blimp. 30 feet of the stadium roof was also burnt up. So much for the magical Davis Smith blimp. In the same New York Times front page that reported the crash of the blimp, Davis told Times reporters that although he expected La Follette to carry six or eight states, he, Davis, wasn't worried because the rogue Wisconsin senator would draw off mainly Republican votes and thus was a much bigger threat to Coolidge than to him. Wishful thinking knew no bounds among Democrats in 1924. On November 4, 1924, most Americans went to the polls. This was the first election in which Native Americans had the vote on a nationwide level, thanks to a controversial act of Congress passed earlier in the year, and it was the second election in which women could vote, though a few states had enfranchised women and Native Americans significantly before the 1920s. Not all Native Americans even wanted or recognized American citizenship. That issue is beyond the scope of our story here. Whether the results of the election were surprising or not depends on your expectations. Coolidge won easily, of course, and that wasn't a surprise at all. The Republicans' nightmare scenario of the election going to the House and Charles Bryan ending up as president didn't even come close to happening. Coolidge got 15,723,789 votes, or 54% of the popular vote. Only the landslides of Hoover in 1928, Eisenhower in the 1950s, Lyndon Johnson in 1964, Nixon in 1972, and Ronald Reagan in the 1980s were larger. In fact, no president has won with a share larger than Coolidge's since Reagan in 1984. Davis, the Democratic candidate, got 8,386,242 votes, or 28.8% of the popular vote. This is the single worst showing for a Democrat in the entire history of presidential elections since 1860. And there's a good argument for not even counting 1860 because the Democratic vote split that year. By contrast, the biggest Democratic loser in modern history, George McGovern in 1972, managed to scare up 37% of the vote. Walter Mondale, with whom Ronald Reagan polished the floor in 1984, got 40%. Davis scored almost 12 percentage points worse than Walter Mondale. Davis lost his own state, West Virginia. He lost Nebraska, the home state of his running mate, Charles Bryan, and his much more well-known brother, William Jennings Bryan. That's fairly rare in American history for both candidates at the top of the ticket to lose their home states, and it only tends to happen in the biggest landslides. With the exception of one state, Oklahoma, the map of states that Davis won in 1924 exactly tracks the map of the Civil War era Confederacy. Recall that Davis was the only one of the three candidates to attack the Ku Klux Klan explicitly and repeatedly during the campaign, and went so far as to insult the Klan emissary who tried to bribe him by tearing up that letter in his face. So why did Davis win all the states where segregation and Jim Crow were the most entrenched? 
It seems the Klan was not as powerful as they pretended to be, and that they wanted everyone to think they were. Some states where the KKK was very strong in the mid-20s, like Oregon, went solidly for Coolidge. Davis came out on top only in states where prohibition plus racism barely outweighed all other issues. Even New York, wet anti-Klan and home of a popular Catholic governor, voted for Coolidge. While the data isn't crystal clear, women seem to have increased their turnout very slightly in 1924, to 35.3% as compared to 35.1% in 1920. Women and men seem to have split for Coolidge and Davis in roughly equal proportions, showing that again, as in 1920, women did not vote as a block. So now we turn to the third guy in the race. His results are both surprisingly good and surprisingly bad, depending on how you look at it. Robert La Follette, the independent candidate, got 4,831,706 votes, or 16.6%. That's exceptionally good for a third-party candidate. With the exception of Teddy Roosevelt in 1912, who was basically a Republican, the only third-party candidate to do better in the entire 20th century was Ross Perot, who scored about 18% of the popular vote in 1992. Unlike Perot, whose support was spread out more or less evenly over the whole country, thanks to relying on broadcast media for his name recognition, La Follette won 13 electoral votes, all of those being from his home state of Wisconsin. La Follette won just shy of 54% in his home state and absolutely clowned John W. Davis, who got a measly 8%. Furthermore, La Follette came in second to Coolidge in 11 states, including California. The counties that La Follette won, if plotted on a map, show surprising flashes of green amidst all that Coolidge red. That's the good news for La Follette. The bad news was that even most voters who leaned progressive chose somebody else, usually Coolidge. La Follette's main message was that monopoly capitalism was threatening the American way of life. But by the 1920s, unlike the mostly agrarian past that had persisted up until the end of the 19th century, more Americans than ever before were wage earners who worked for corporations and business interests. La Follette's popularity in the farm west and among the urban working class was far less than expected, and probably far less than it would have been in 1912, when, if he had ever had a chance to be president, would probably have been his time. The 1924 election was strange, with a lot of contradictory and confusing currents flowing through it. What all observers could agree on was that the Democratic Party, with its disastrous, racist, and divisive convention in New York, dropped its pants and thoroughly crapped on any slim chance it might have had to eke out a win that year. Maybe Coolidge was unbeatable, maybe not. But once the convention became such a ghastly circus, the Democrats were utterly incapable of making any headway against him. It almost didn't matter what candidate emerged from the convention. He was doomed no matter what. Indeed, Davis himself said after the election that a friend asked him if he said anything during the campaign that he didn't believe. Oh yes, Davis replied. I went around the country telling people I was going to be elected, and I knew I hadn't any more chance than a snowball in hell. Two weeks after the election, Davis, who remarked that he felt like a sucked orange, went on vacation in the Mediterranean for four months. In March 1925, he returned to his Wall Street law firm as if nothing had happened. Coolidge's reaction to his election was characteristically terse. His official statement ran to all of two sentences, thanking divine providence for his election. He was still broken and listless after the death of his son. He was suffering from asthma and digestive difficulties. Notably, a month after the election, on December 3rd, 1924, when it came time for Coolidge to give his State of the Union address, he wrote it down and had a clerk read it to Congress. He chose not to appear in person, as he'd done the year before. On election night, Robert La Follette and his sons listened to the returns on the radio at the office of Governor John Blaine. They drove back to La Follette's home in Maple Bluff, Wisconsin, late that night. In the car, the sons lamented that organized labor seemed to have deserted them in the election. Bob La Follette snapped back, quote, we have had hard times, but never the haunting fear of losing your job, of losing those paychecks that are all that stand between starvation for those workers and their families. 
Don't blame the folks. They just got scared, end quote. La Follette was still a sitting senator from Wisconsin, and he quickly returned to Washington, as the special and final session of the 68th Congress convened in December 1924. La Follette stayed on through the beginning of the next Congress, attending to his legislative business with his usual ferocity. One of the issues he worked on was the Senate's rejection of Coolidge's nominee for Attorney General, Charles Warren, who La Follette and other progressives thought was cl too closely tied to monopolies. In poor health, La Follette did not return to Wisconsin after the congressional session ended in mid-March. On May 18, 1925, at his home in Washington, La Follette suffered a major heart attack. Bedridden after that, La Follette played and joked with his family, including a newborn grandchild. He read detective magazines and pretended he wasn't dying. On June 18, 1925, he suffered another seizure, possibly another heart attack, and died, age 70. On Wednesday, March 4, 1925, it was 44 degrees Fahrenheit in Washington, D.C. President Coolidge rode to the Capitol in an open car with his wife and Charles Curtis, senator from Kansas. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. Coolidge took the oath of office. He gave an address totaling some 4,000 words, quite long for him, in which he called for tax cuts and proclaimed that the purpose of America was to merit the favor of Almighty God. A private charity ball was held that night at the Mayflower Hotel. I assume President and Mrs. Coolidge attended the event, but probably didn't stay long. Parties just weren't their style, and in any event, their hearts weren't in it. Chattanooga, Chattanooga, down in Tennessee. It would be hard to say that voters didn't get what they wanted when most of them voted for Calvin Coolidge in 1924. The term that he began on March 4th, 1925, was marked by enormous economic prosperity, at least measured in terms of corporate profits. But there was a genuine increase in the standard of living for many Americans, though by no means all. In terms of foreign policy, it was pretty tranquil. Aside from the usual meddlings in Latin America, very common for U.S. presidents of both parties in the 20th century, Coolidge faced no major foreign policy crises, nor did he make any particular groundbreaking strides in either foreign or domestic policy. He was a caretaker president, not an activist. Historians and others have debated whether Coolidge foresaw the Great Depression coming or if not, whether he should have. Beyond a general awareness that economic prosperity doesn't last forever, I don't think there's any evidence that Coolidge saw it coming. The causes of the Depression were complex, and many of them, especially the decline in agricultural prices and the stock market bubble, were going on during Coolidge's presidency. But the notion that Coolidge saw the crash of 1929 coming and decided not to run for president again because he didn't want to be tagged with the blame for it is nonsense, in my opinion. On August 2nd, 1927, while Coolidge was vacationing at his informal summer White House in the Black Hills of South Dakota, he had his secretary pass out slips of paper to reporters who had gathered for an earlier press conference. The papers had one sentence written on them. I do not choose to run for president in 1928. The fact that so many people, including Herbert Hoover, found ambiguity in this statement when it's so unequivocal is frankly pretty shocking. Coolidge never had any intention of running again, though he could have if he wanted to. Herbert Hoover, Secretary of Commerce, and in the words of a reporter, Under Secretary of Everything Else, immediately seemed to be the Republican frontrunner for 1928. Hoover was not only a wealthy, self-made businessman, but a skilled administrator, having run a massive program of food aid to Europe after World War I, and then serving successfully in Coolidge's cabinet. It sounds incredible, but many Americans, when they heard that Hoover was running for president, thought, well, now our problems are over. Seriously, they thought that. The idea was that Hoover was the most successful, the smartest, and the most competent man who had ever sought the office. That he would win easily was pretty much a foregone conclusion. Al Smith, who was still governor of New York in 1928, was itching for another try at the Democratic nomination. That year, the Democrats were extremely wary of the public disaster of their 1924 convention and were eager not to repeat it. 
Smith and the Democrats were lucky that William McAdoo was temporarily retired from politics and wanted no part of the 1928 campaign. Without his intransigence, the Democratic National Convention of 1928, held in Houston, was dominated by the northern and eastern wing of the party, and they easily nominated Smith. So he did ultimately get his wish of being the first Catholic to be a major party nominee in American history. Unfortunately, that, plus Smith's stance on prohibition, he was wet, remember, often get the credit for his epic defeat in 1928. While I'm not sure that a Catholic could have won the presidency in the 1920s under any circumstances, Smith had no chance of defeating Hoover no matter what his religion was or what his stance on prohibition was. He, like Davis in 1924, was doomed from the start. The Ku Klux Klan's fortunes were declining in the later 1920s. They were at the peak of their influence about 1924, but as we've seen, they weren't as influential as they like to think they were. Though membership and revenues were strongly on the downslope in 1928, Smith's nomination breathed new life into their hateful activities, and they went around the country spreading the usual anti-Catholic conspiracy theories against him. The Klan got their wish in the sense that Smith was utterly annihilated in the election, but not because of anything the Klan did. When the Depression hit, the KKK, which, as you recall, was a business as well as a terrorist hate group, shrank rapidly. Down to 30,000 members in 1930, had 4 million in 1924, the Klan basically faded away by the World War II era and was officially disbanded in 1944. The Klan that exists today was a new successor organization, basically a reboot, which came up in the South in the civil rights era of the 1950s. Hoover, of course, elected overwhelmingly on a tide of optimism in 1928, caught much of the blame for the Great Depression that began after the twin crashes of the Wall Street stock market in October 1929, when the great American stock bubble burst. Hoover was generally opposed to using the government to intervene economically in the lives of individual people. Thus, the man who in 1928 seemed to know how to do everything sat back and did nothing. The debacle of the bonus march on Washington in the summer of 1932 did Hoover no favors. His Democratic opponent, Franklin Roosevelt, didn't articulate any specific plans to alleviate the Depression, but he promised that he'd do something, and for the desperate American people, something was better than nothing. Roosevelt's landslide 1932 victory marked the beginning of a new and ultimately durable coalition in democratic politics, finally overcoming the divisiveness that made 1924 such a disaster. William Gibbs McAdoo, Wilson's son-in-law, stayed out of politics for the rest of the 20s, but got back in during the Depression era. He ran for the California Senate in 1932 and played a dramatic role in the Democratic Convention in Chicago that year. Controlling California's delegation, McAdoo made a political deal with FDR's forces, which involved clearing any political patronage positions in California with McAdoo first. On the floor of the convention, McAdoo announced in the roll call vote that California was casting its votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. McAdoo did win his Senate race that year, but he lost the nomination in the next election, 1938, to another Democrat. By that time, McAdoo's wife, Woodrow Wilson's daughter, had divorced him. He died in February 1941 while traveling back home to California after attending Roosevelt's third inauguration. Despite the fact that FDR had started his political career largely as Al Smith's mini-me protege, the two of them had a falling out in 1932, and Smith even tried to challenge Roosevelt for the Democratic nomination, though he didn't get very far. Smith became an ardent critic of FDR's New Deal policies and even supported his Republican opponents in the 1936 and 1940 elections. In 1941, Smith and Roosevelt had a somewhat frosty reconciliation. Smith, out of politics, was instrumental in getting the Empire State Building constructed. He died of a heart attack in New York City in October 1944, just before FDR's fourth election as president. John W. Davis, the Democratic nominee in 1924, joined Smith in his opposition to the New Deal, and he also supported Alf Landon, the Republican nominee against FDR in 1936, and Wendell Wilkie, the 1940 Republican nominee. Davis had long since returned to private law practice. In the mid-1930s, he was implicated in the infamous business plot 
which was a fascist conspiracy by conservative businessmen and generals to overthrow the government and oust Franklin Roosevelt as president. Historians differ on how serious the business plot actually was, though it does appear that something nefarious was afoot. Of course, it never went off. Though implicated, Davis was not charged with anything. Throughout the rest of his legal career, Davis managed to remain on more or less the wrong side of history on almost every major issue, culminating with his appearance before the Supreme Court in 1954, arguing on behalf of the state of South Carolina for the maintenance of segregation in public schools in the case of Briggs v. Elliott, a companion case to Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka. Davis was gobsmacked when the Supreme Court unanimously struck down school segregation. He died less than a year later, in March 1955, in Charleston, South Carolina. William Jennings Bryan, the OG progressive-era politician, did swallow his objections to Davis and did some campaigning for him during the 1924 election season. But the public perception was that Bryan was old, out of touch, and very much past his prime. In the end, religious fundamentalism, rather than trust-busting or even prohibition, emerged as the most important issue for Bryan. A few months after the election, in the summer of 1925, Bryan famously took the side of the prosecution in the Tennessee criminal case of science teacher John Scopes, who was brought up on charges of violating a Tennessee law that criminalized the teaching of evolution in public schools. The Scopes Monkey Trial, as it was called, was a public media sensation and saw Bryan facing off against the most famous lawyer in America at the time, Clarence Darrow. Bryan won the case. Scopes was convicted, but it was something of a Pyrrhic victory, both for the anti-evolutionists and for Bryan personally. A few days after the trial ended, Bryan died in his sleep of some kind of hemorrhage where he was staying in Tennessee, age 65. History has not been kind to him. The other Bryan in this story, Charles, the 1924 Democratic vice presidential nominee, ran for governor of Nebraska several more times, succeeding in 1930 and 32. He tried unsuccessfully to run for the U.S. Senate from Nebraska. He died in March 1945 in Lincoln, Nebraska. Although Robert La Follette died in June 1925 and the classic progressive political tradition was mostly over, the La Follette family continued in politics. La Follette's son, Bob Jr., was elected in September 1925 to finish out his father's Senate term, then won election on his own as a Republican in 1928. While still in the Senate, La Follette Jr. switched to the Progressive Party in 1936. He was finally defeated in the 1946 Senate race by none other than Joseph McCarthy, the Republican who went on to trigger the second Red Scare in 1950. La Follette Jr. died by suicide in early 1953. Some say he was driven to it by the McCarthyist hysteria, which had targeted members of his staff, accused of being communists. Philip La Follette, Bob's other son, served as governor of Wisconsin in the 1930s, and even tried to form a new progressive party in America, which he hoped would run a presidential candidate after the conclusion of FDR's second term. That didn't quite go to plan, as Roosevelt was elected a third time. Philip La Follette, who stood down as governor in 1939, became president of an electronics company and died in 1965. Charles Dawes, Coolidge's vice presidential candidate, who had proven so handy on the campaign trail, basically made a mockery of himself once he actually became vice president. In contrast to his soft-spoken boss, on Inauguration Day 1925, Dawes gave an angry speech to the Senate, the vice president is the president of the Senate too, in which he railed against the tactic of filibusters. Then he forced new senators to take their oaths of office one by one instead of all together, which was customary. Coolidge was annoyed by Dawes, and the two gradually became politically and personally estranged. Dawes went so far as to champion legislation pertaining to farm relief, which Coolidge ended up vetoing. Passed over for reconsideration as vice president at the 1928 Republican convention, Dawes went on to serve as U.S. ambassador to Great Britain. He eventually retired from political life and died in 1951. For his work in restructuring Germany's Versailles peace debt, Dawes won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1925, the only sitting U.S. vice president to win one, Al Gore won his for his work on addressing human-caused global warming after he was out of office. 
After leaving the White House in early 1929, Calvin and Grace Coolidge bought a retirement estate in Northampton, Massachusetts, called The Beaches, and lived there quietly. Coolidge served on various boards and associations and, for a time, was president of the American Antiquarian Society, in whose archives I did some of the research for my Ph.D. dissertation. I remember walking into the library every morning under the portrait of Calvin Coolidge hanging over the doorway. He wrote his memoirs and tried to write a newspaper column, but he wasn't that good at it. Listless and often ill, Coolidge never recovered from the death of his son, Cal Jr., on January 5, 1933, Coolidge went to his office not far from his house at the beaches, but returned home at 10 a.m., apparently not feeling well. After being driven home, he drank a glass of water, talked briefly to the gardener, then went upstairs, took off his jacket and vest in preparation for shaving, and promptly collapsed to the floor, dead of a coronary thrombosis. He was only 60. Grace Coolidge continued to live at the beaches until 1937. By all accounts, she kept her sense of humor and her zest for life, long after her husband's death, but she always mourned him and their son. She volunteered for the Red Cross and led scrap drives during World War II. In 1957, she died, aged 78, and was buried next to the president in Vermont. It would be difficult to call the presidential election of 1924 a turning point in American history. It just wasn't that. Given all the other material that history teachers have to get through, I know I am one, they can be forgiven for skipping over this election, and not very many books have been written about it. But those that have, like the exceptional The 103rd Ballot by Robert K. Murray, are very interesting. But there's a lot we can learn from examining this election closely. The 1920s were a strange and chaotic era in American history, and that often gets lost in retellings of this period of history. Given that I have the freedom on my channel to investigate these lesser-known corners of history, I thought this unusual election was worth a look, and I hope you got something out of it too. My sources for this video, including the 103rd Ballot and various others, are listed in the credits, coming up in just a minute or so, and also in the video description. All the music you've heard in the interstitials throughout this video, that's all jazz recordings, actually from the year 1924. I've got a section in the credits listing those as well. People do often ask about the music in my videos. No part of the script or research for this video was generated by AI. I want to thank fellow history YouTuber Mr. Beat, who provided the voice of Calvin Coolidge. I highly recommend his channel, which is also linked in the description. There are many more deep dive videos on this channel. This is the second specifically election focused one, the other being 1872. I also did videos on the Iran-Contra scandal of the 1980s, the Persian Gulf War, the fall of European and Asian monarchies in the first decades of the 20th century, and even a history of urban poop. My blog is at gardenofmemory.net. Sign up there to get interesting historical articles in your inbox. Thank you to all my viewers, subscribers, and supporters. You enable me to continue to do what I do on this channel, and I'm grateful for it. And also thanks to my sponsor, Ground News. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, do all the stuff that you normally do for a video you like, and I'll be back in a few weeks with another deep dive video. Thanks for joining me on another journey into the past. Peace and bubbles, all you others, take the bad seat. Cause I know all fellows that all of you see. His name is Chattanooga, Chattanooga, down in Tennessee.